All right. <laughs> All right, court will call uh, 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury is not present in the courtroom. Um, it's 279 or 379, 279, okay. Um, I wanted to address one thing to make sure that the record is clear. Exhibit 279 is a um, uh, disc, a CD-ROM disc um, of USAA financial transaction summary. It was never actually um, formally admitted. Uh, I think it may have been discussed during either. Okay. Actually, I'm not sure whose testimony it would have been. Maybe Detective V Hills. Um, in any event, uh, my understanding is that there is a stipulation to the admission of Exhibit 279. Is that accurate? That's correct. Sir. Okay. Your Honor, um, the people will also move for admission in front of the jury so that they're aware of that exhibit, um, not to be redundant, but just so that they're aware of the exhibit number and the name. Um, will that be permissible? Run that by me again. Um, we would like to put that disc, this particular exhibit, on the record in front of the jury so they're just aware of its existence and its number. Oh, okay. All right. Is that okay. Okay. All right, is there anything else we need to address before we bring the jury in? Prosecution? I don't think so. Okay, let's go ahead and bring them in. I moved that once. I don't know how that got back up there. And Your Honor, I will move the easel once the jury is seated in front of the door. Uh, okay. I just want to make sure that the um, the other gentleman that's helping us <laughs> doesn't walk into it if he opens the door. Um, we'll let him know. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I take. Uh, are you going to use it for the whole for the entirety of the next witness? Uh, for a good chunk of it, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll let him know. Thank you. Or maybe not. Huh. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Has anything occurred since we were last together that causes any of you to believe you could not continue to serve as a fair and impartial juror in this case? If so, please raise your hand. Spots. All right. Yesterday, uh, we had concluded the testimony of one witness. Um, prosecution, call your next witness, please. John Sarkeesian, Your Honor. And if you would raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear from the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Ms. Gratiano. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, would you please state your name again for the record and spell your last name as well? So, Lieutenant John Sarkeesian. Last name is S-A-R-K-I-S-I-A-N. And Lieutenant, where are you currently employed? Uh, at the Opaxa County Sheriff's Office over the patrol division. And how long have you been with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, it'll be 22 years in September. And over the course of your time at the sheriff's office, um, have you had many roles, different roles? I have. Um, I've been many different units, uh, patrol detentions. Um, I was the homicide uh, or major crimes sergeant for approximately two and a half years. I've uh, been in Metro Vice Narcotics, um, been over the SWAT team. Uh, yeah, so I've been, I've been in many areas of the office. Worn different hats. Yes. 
In January and February of 2020, what was your specific assignment? Uh, so I was assigned to the Special Operations Division, uh, which is over our SWAT team as the SWAT commander. And uh, I also had our traffic unit and some other smaller units. And as it relates to the Special Operations section, uh, as it relates specifically to the investigation of the disappearance of Gannon Stauk at that time in February and January of 2020, what was your specific role? So I was assigned as the basically the incident commander for the search efforts. Um, I was called to a meeting and basically signed in an incident command uh, system. The way it's set up, we have operational chiefs in different positions to run different aspects of investigation. So I was assigned for the search efforts. And is was that something that you had done previously in other cases? Um, I, I mean, not to this degree but definitely uh, have been involved with incident command throughout my career in, in the different roles that I've played. So that was a big piece of the SWAT team um, in running SWAT calls. So we have to be able to, you know, manage all those resources. So I think that's why they selected me for it. And can you explain to the jury a little bit more what incident command means? What is that? Uh, it's just a, it's basically a system that is put together. So everybody knows what they're doing, uh, where they should be, how they should operate. So it's broke out into different branches, so to say, uh, law enforcement, fire, financial. Um, obviously, when we're searching uh, to the magnitude we did in this case, we have a lot of people. Uh, so food plays in, um, you know, gas, different resources. So it's just a, it's a whole system put together. It looks like a tree that's broke out into everybody's role. So when you come in for the day, you know what you're doing. And you're overseeing that tree? Correct. Okay. And now you mentioned the scope um, of the resources. Is that something that you personally, while you work with the sheriff's office, have you ever seen something on this scale before? I haven't. Okay. And in terms of what was known to you and other members of law enforcement in January and February of 2020, um, had the location of Gannon Stauk been identified yet? It had not. Okay. You mentioned many, many resources. Can you give the jury an idea of which agencies came in to help and assist you? So the, the two major ones would have been search and rescue, and then the National Guard came in. Uh, the National Guard was able to provide a lot of volunteers, a lot of different people that were able to help out with the search. Um, and then search and rescue was also the other big one. They, they pulled people from wherever they could from different search and rescue units to come in and help. Um, we also had different agencies. Uh, I, I know you'll probably get into it, but when we moved up north, we had Douglas County that helped out. We had some volunteers that wanted to fly drones for us. Um, we had a lot of civilians reaching out to want to help, and we, we, we kind of avoided that to a certain degree. But depending on what the volunteer um, looked like, we could have other people help with that too. Um, different police agencies, wherever we were going, um, it just it's just depended. I mean, it was uh, an, an outpouring of people that were ready and willing to come out and search. And, you know, on particular days, um, did the number of people that were, were actually in charge of supervising and coordinating search efforts, how did that vary? Uh, it could, it, it depended on, you know, in the beginning, um, there was a lot, so to say, and to, to answer your question, I would say anywhere between, I mean, it could be 20 or 30 people helping to hundreds. So it just depended on uh, the area, the time frame, and the availability of people. We were trying every day to get as many people as possible because it's just easier to cover the, cover the area we were searching. Now, in terms of your initial efforts in organizing um, the very massive search, um, uh, end of January of 2020, where were the search efforts as you were supervising them? Where were they focused? What part of the city? So we started in that Lorson Ranch area, which was down south. Um, we kind of started from the, the residents and moved north from there. So as the uh, command over the search efforts, I had a liaison in the detectives division, <coughs> and which was another lieutenant. So he was... I didn't have a lot of case detail. He was just providing me areas to focus searching. So he, he would call and say, hey, 
um, we we have this little bit or we have that this little piece of information. We need to you know search in this specific area, and then we would identify zones in that area and then organize people and how we were going to move through those areas and, and cover that. So we, we started in the Lorson Ranch area. We moved um, north of there, up, up towards Bradley Road and some of that area through there. Then we also moved across over by Fountain Creek for a little bit. Um, we ended up going up to Perry Park. We did a little bit off of Highway 105. So there was a, a several different areas that we searched. Now, uh, you mentioned off Highway 105. Are you generally familiar with that area? Uh, I am. Okay. And can you give the jury a frame of reference as to when the, when the search efforts you were coordinating were focused in that particular uh, area? All right. Just for clarification, you're talking about the Perry Park or Highway 105? Well, we'll take them separately. Um, either one. We can start with the Perry Park Road. Uh, so, yeah, Perry Park, I believe, was around... Uh, I think it was February 12th to about February 20th. We were up in that area. Uh, we spent several days up through there. Okay. And the Highway 105 area? Uh, I don't know the specifics on the date of that one. It was somewhere mixed in. I, I feel mixed in the middle of that. Um, that was a shorter um, stay over there just because we had some information to just check some real specific uh, places off the road. Okay. So we didn't spend a lot of time in the 105 area, maybe now, like a day or two. Okay. In terms of, can you give the jury an idea of the general uh, state of, you know, what the topography there? I mean, what is it heavily wooded? What is the area that looks, um, we're talking about the South Perry Park Road area. What does that look like? Yeah. So as you, if you're not familiar, as you head up out of Palmer Lake, it's kind of open fields. Uh, there's a very specific S turn. Uh, that comes out of town. And once you hit that, the first S curve and you start up, it becomes to be very heavily um, wooded, so to say, brush, um, big pine trees. And then you move, the road uh, turns back to the right to head north. And there's also a lot of trees and some fields, but it, you're right up against the mountains at that point. So it's it's pretty heavy cover. Now, you mentioned various tools and resources um, that were of use, but specifically in that area, what kind of tools and resources were really essential for you guys? So when we were first sent up to that area, when I drove it to go kind of get an idea of where to put the command post and, and how we're going to separate it into zones, uh, I noticed there was a significant amount of snow still. So there was uh, several drifts. It's, you know, right up against the mountains, like I said. So drifts, heavy snow. Um, different, you know, a lot of different elements to that. So search and rescue, when we brought them in, uh, one major thing they used was what they called probing poles, um, which they actually had to find more because they, you know, they tend to break or they lose or whatever. But it's it's basically just a long pole that they can stick down in the snow and probe for what they're feeling. You know, they can They've been doing this long enough that uh, they were telling me they can, you know, if they hit dirt, they can feel that. If they hit something soft uh, that doesn't feel like the ground should, then they'll stop. And then they'll, you know, dig the snow out, clear that area, search more specifically for what's under the snow there. Once they identify it, then they can move on and continue to do that. Um, so obviously shovels, um, tools t specific tool wise you mean like well how about um the use of uh, canines for example okay. so resource wise yeah we had um we did have a volunteer that flew a drone over that area um we had they brought the canines in so i think fbi had a couple of their dogs running through there um so there was a lot of uh i think who else we had or what else we were using up there drones and uh what about overhead planes um so in the um uh, lorson ranch area when we were searching down there we had and i believe it was national guard they were able to fly a plane uh over the area and give us some uh, aerial images so okay and you mentioned information known to law enforcement. Can you explain why some of the search uh, efforts were focused specifically in that South Perry Park Road area? 
Uh, hold on one second for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Apologize. That's all right. Uh, can you ask that question again? Yeah. Um, you mentioned an S turn at South Perry Park Road area. Uh, what was the information that law enforcement was receiving or received um, that had you focus in that particular area? Uh, so, like I said, I had a liaison through the detectives division. Um, he had provided some information that a um, tracker information uh, had shown um, a vehicle that traveled up through that area and then had specifically slowed down in a certain section um, and then moved. And then I think it had come back through. But the, the information provided to me was that the, you know, uh, vehicle was up in that area. And the specific vehicle that you're referring to, do you remember the make, model, year, anything like that? Um, I don't. I recall um, him telling me that it was um, Batisha's vehicle that was... Uh, that they had tracked up through that area. And that's why they were moving us up there. Okay. And in terms of, you mentioned the law enforcement resources in terms of tracking that vehicle, did that include uh, members of surveillance, uh, MBNI, that sort of information provided them to you? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Okay. I, I don't know if they actually, I, I wasn't privy to that information, whether or not they were had followed a vehicle or not. Okay. Uh, on February 15th of 2020, were you on duty that day? I was. Okay. And um, did you find anything in particular of note on that day? Um, I did. So on February 15th, I mean, like I said, we'd been working uh, several days in a row, doing a lot of search efforts. Um, on that day, go ahead. Sorry. And sorry to cut you off, but... Um, We'll go through, um, I'll introduce a few exhibits through you, but before we get there, um, to start, what was the particular item that you located? Uh, so I lo located a piece of particle board that was approximately two feet by two and a half feet and half inch thick that was off the side of the road. Okay. Um, okay. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness? You may. Thank you. Lieutenant, I'm showing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 326 for the record. Do you yeah. recognize it? I do. How do you recognize it? Uh, that is the upper turn of the S turn of the search area. Okay. And you mentioned that you found a board. Correct. There's a label that appears on this map. Um, does that label mean anything to you? Yeah, that would be accurate to the location where I found it. And is People's Exhibit 326 a fair and accurate representation? of that area and where you located that board. It is. Your Honor, permission to admit people's 326 for the record. Exhibit 326 will be admitted. Yes. And before we go further in, um, just about something that we discussed earlier, uh, the jury should also know that Exhibit 279 um, is also admitted by stipulation. It is a, a CD disc, um, I assume is on the table there. Um, it's a CD disc of USAA financial transactions. Um, and so that's also evidence that you may consider during this case. Ms. Graziano. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Lieutenant Sarkeesian, can you point out for the jury um, the particular area. I know that the label is clear, but if you wouldn't mind standing up and just uh, going through the area uh, and pointing out a few things on the map for me. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned an S turn. Can you explain to the jury um, in part, you know, kind of what you mean by that? So if this map continued, the road curves back this way. So as you come up here, this would be the, the upper turn and then it's heading north out of Town that way. Okay. And you mentioned uh, coordinating search efforts. Can you give the jury a frame of reference on People's Exhibit 326? Um, you know, where you are coordinating all those efforts from, if we can see it on that map? So we basically made this into zones. Um, this is kind of where the uh, treat area would start. 
this was also heavy snow cover uh, because of the side of the road. So uh, we made this into zones, basically, or I made it into zones that came up through here, across up the road, and then up into about this area up here. So this was pretty much our zone. Our, that map is a pretty good representation of our zoned out areas. Okay. And as you're coordinating search efforts, are you doing that in some sort of methodical way so you Absolutely. understand where efforts are being done and over time can you explain that to the jury as well yeah absolutely so if this was if you can picture this as being at zone a we'll say um we had search and rescue national guard whoever was helping us basically start on one end of the zone um this they had to use the poles a lot because of the snow and they basically just moved as a group up here um within feet of each other and just searching that whole area as they moved and once they so once they would complete a zone if uh, you know they got up to this road and that was the end of the zone, then they would report that back through the chain, which would come to me that you know we've completed this zone. Okay, and um, we talked about February fifteenth of twenty twenty when you found the board. Can you give uh, the jury a walkthrough of of um, generally the snow levels in that area? It's Colorado, but or the snow levels around there on that day. Um, on that day, it, it so we had a variation up there. Uh, some days it would be snowing, some days it would be sunny. So we had we had some melt off and we had some snow. It was generally a mix of um, some thawed out areas, some little bit thicker areas, some dirt. So it was kind of just all over as far as uh, snow cover, sporadic. All right, and so when the sun comes out in Colorado, uh, what happens to the snow? <laughs> Absolutely. It was, right. It was melting in certain areas. Okay. So fair to say um, a day or two before, would the snow levels in that area have been different? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there, we had a couple of heavy snow days where it actually came in and we were trying to beat the snow to cover some of the zones. Um, and then snow, we'd have to, you know, tailor that to the surge. So. Okay, great. Because the, the coldness played in too then. We had a bunch of people out in the cold. So. Right. And you can take a seat now. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, permission to approach the uh, witness? You may. <clears throat> Lieutenant, I'm showing you what's been marked as people's exhibits 327 through 331. Okay. Do you recognize those? I do. How do you recognize them? Uh, these are all pictures taken from the search area on during that time period. Okay. And are they a fair and accurate depiction of the search efforts on February 15th of 2020? They are. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we would move for the admission of People's Exhibits uh, 327 through 331. No objection. Exhibits 327 through 331 will be admitted. And Your Honor, permission to publish as well? You may. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant, you mentioned the snow. So I'll ask you to walk the jury through what we see projected behind you, People's Exhibit 327. Um, can you orient the jury as to where we're at um, on the map in front of you? Where is this photo? So as this photo is taken, it's taken from here on this map. So it's actually pointing up at the S curve as you come around it. And there's also a pointer. It's an old school pointer that may be on the witness stand. Uh, you'll have to extend it. If, you, if you'd like to use that, okay. you can. Um, there are a number of cars that we see in the road there. Um, are those some of the people that are helping out the search effort? Correct. Uh, search and rescue and or National Guard. Okay. On the passenger side area of those cars, um, there appears to be a large, uh, <laughs> large white uh area next to those cars what is that are you looking at this right here yes uh so this is a this is a berm that is just built up from the road right there i don't know if it used to have a pond behind it or or what but it's just a maybe a seven or eight foot berm okay and as you're out there um for search efforts on february 15th of 2020 can you walk um the jury through um what were things that were of note for you 
maybe uh, in People's Exhibit 328. What are we seeing in this particular photo that may be helpful for you to explain? Okay. Um, oh. So just for clarification, do you want uh, as far as the board goes or? And just ex explaining uh, your efforts that day as it led to you finding the board. Okay. Uh, so on this particular day, obviously with these vehicles lined up here, we had searchers in this, in our zone, which on this map over here would have been um, up through this area would have been the zone that they were in. Um, on that particular day on the 15th, uh, I had been in the command post for several days, and so I grabbed one of the search and rescue guys that was one of the head head guys for the operation and said, hey, let's jump in the Razor, which you saw in the other picture. Um, can you actually go back one picture? Yeah, no problem. So this, this guy that's parked right here uh, is what we ended up taking from the command post, which was uh, significantly north of this location. Um, I said, hey, let's just get out and go check on the, the searchers, see how it's going out there in the zone. Um, as we were getting out there, we were notified that one of the dogs had alerted on a area, which from this picture would be basically behind this berm. Um, there's a there's a gate you can't really see, like a, a bob wire fence. Um, so up behind the berm there, the dog had alerted. So we were out there like, well, let's go check on the dog. Um, we walked up there. They were doing some digging and some searching around the dog, nothing that we really found as significant there. So as I came back um, on this map here, there's a uh, there's a bob wire fence that runs along the, the side of the road. Um, as I came back, I started looking at the fence and um, I'd asked some of the guys, hey, has anybody checked this fence? They kind of looked at me funny. I said, you know, you cross a fence, if you ever cross the bob wire fence, maybe catch your pants on it, maybe catch your shirt on it. Um, it can, you know, snag threads, it can, you know, catch animal hairs, that type of thing. Uh, so I just started walking up that fence from this picture. And if you go to the next picture. So People's Exhibit 328. So this is the fence, obviously, that runs along here. So I was walking the fence when I got up to about this, this area and generally in this area. Um, I noticed uh, a board sitting on the ground. There was some uh, footprints past it, like other searchers had walked through that area, uh, but it did not appear that the board had been moved. Um, I say that because there was snow on part of the board and the snow was, was not cracked. So it's not like someone had moved the board. Um, so and when I saw the board, uh, the board I could see right off had some type of stain or something on it as I moved closer to look at it. Um, I used a, a glove to, I actually had to move it because I didn't know what it was at that point. And I'll stop um, you there, sir. Sorry. We're going to walk through. That's fine. But I want to show the jury People's Exhibit 329 um, so that you can use these to explain. So as you approach that area, what are we seeing is People's Exhibit 329? So this is this is the, the ball wire fence is in the background here. You can see the post. Um, so I was walking up this way. This is the board. Um, this is the stain I'm referring to on the board, and then the snow, how the, it had caught the corner of it, was still sitting under the snow. And is this how the board appeared to you when you first spotted it? Uh, it is. Okay. And so, before I cut you off, you were explaining to the jury how you'd seen the edge of the board, um, and you mentioned a glove. Um, why did you use a glove? Well... Once I, once I saw the board and saw that stain on the board, um, knowing we were looking for any items that could be associated to this case, uh, so we had put that out to, you know, Search and Rescue National Guard to, to look for any and all items that, you know, could be of evidence. So one thing to note for these search efforts we'd been doing, um, we had been checking the sides of roads a lot. So what do you come across a lot on sides of road? Trash, cans, old gloves, socks. I mean, you name it, we found it. So a lot of the stuff that was found along the sides of the road, um, you don't know if it's evidence until it's evidence, basically. Um, so, you know, if someone found something, we would say if it, if it looked like something that could possibly be evidence to notify someone uh, from command, and then we'd send out people to collect it. 
And in terms of distance between where the road is and where you now discovered this board, can you give us an approximation? Um, you know, from the from the road to the berm, um, I would estimate 20, 30 feet. This was probably in the middle of that, somewhere 10, 15 feet in from the edge of the road to the berm. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't far off the road. I mean, this is the road right here. And so that we can get, just get a frame of reference for distances. When you say uh, the distance between the road and the berm, where are we talking? So this this map might be easier from so from the edge of this road, and then the berm sits right right here, so to say. Um, that other picture might show it a little bit better if you go back. So for the record, you're pointing on the map on People's Exhibit 326. Uh, now we're looking at 328. So this would be the berm, obviously edge of the road, fence. So approximately 20, 30 feet, I would say, to the, to the berm. Okay. So in the middle of that, in the middle of the two. And for a frame of reference, uh, when you located the board, is it on the other side of that berm? No. Okay. So it's, it's right in these trees right here, Okay. so to say. So when we look at People's Exhibit 329, we're in that tree area near the base of that on the ground there? Correct. Okay. Uh, you mentioned seeing a stain. Uh, we'll look at People's Exhibit 330. Uh, now at this point, uh, what has ha now happened with the board? Uh, so at the point that, like I said, I put a, a glove on to move it um, because I couldn't tell exactly so as I got closer to it, I barely moved it. And from my training experience over the years, um, as soon as I saw that, I was like, that's blood. Um, so I put it back in the position that it was in. Uh, and like I said, I barely moved it uh, just enough to get that look at it. So I set it back in there and then notified one of the FBI uh, personnel to come photograph and collect it. And is it because uh, the FBI was there to help coordinate um, search efforts, but also collection of evidence? Correct. Okay. And uh, in terms of um, collection of that particular uh, piece of evidence, um, who specifically, um, the FBI, then took it into evidence? They did. Okay. Do you recognize people's exhibit? Um, you've already said you recognize it, but can you give us a frame of reference for what we're looking at now in people's exhibit 331? Um, so just a, a scale to the size of the uh, stain that was on the board. Okay. Uh, now, when you were there present that day, um, did you see any other pieces of particle board or wood aside from this? I did not. Okay. And what we're seeing in People's Exhibit 331, uh, can you describe the top right corner area of that board? Yeah. So, I mean, this is how the board was when it was collected. So that broken edge, um, that's just, that's how the, that's how it was. Okay. <laughs> Your Honor, permission to approach with what has been marked as People's Exhibit 332. Go ahead. Sir, I'm showing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 332. You recognize it. I do. How do you recognize it? Uh, that's the board that I was that I found that day. And in terms of labeling of this particular item, is that consistent with the item that you recognize? It is. Okay. And uh, we see some tape on this. Mm -hmm. What does the tape indicate to you? So when you seal an evidence item, you just you seal it with that tape, and you uh, you see the initials on there. That's so anyone knows if that tape's if it's been broken, if the tape's been tampered with or broken, the signature across it will be um, not not in place. And is this in the same or substantially same condition as when you last viewed it, and it was collected on February fifteenth of twenty twenty? Other than the uh, the marks on there, which they obviously did, um, the pen marks, yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we'd move for the admission of People's Exhibit uh, 300 and, I just want to make sure, 332? No objection. 
Exhibit 332 will be admitted. Go ahead. I'm going to ask for your help. Okay. Your Honor, uh, may the witness walk the exhibit as slowly past the jury for publishing purposes. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. You're strong enough. Uh, Lieutenant, after uh, February 15th of 2020, uh, how would you describe the nature of your role uh, as the investigation moved forward in this case? Uh, I still continue to uh, conduct the search efforts. Um, if there was uh, new information coming in from the liaison, uh, I would still coordinate, you know, where we were, where we were going, what we were doing. Um, like I said, I think we continue at least through the 20th. Um, so we still... Same thing, zones, um, getting help, uh, the whole nine yards for searching. And in terms of media presence, uh, when, you, when search efforts were being focused in this particular area, um, was media present? Uh, absolutely. So media was uh, pretty much present through the uh, whole search time and search efforts everywhere we went. Um, it was obvious that we were uh, in the area just from the amount of people, you know, Sheriff's Office, police cars, um, canine, and search and rescue. So media um, caught on fairly quickly. Quickly, We also had our PIO was coordinating efforts to um, keep them uh, either in an area or informed of what was going on. So um, we didn't, when it comes to media, um, we, other than coming into an active crime scene, we can't keep them out. So as long as they can legally be somewhere, they can set up anywhere. So they would set up outside of our command post um, on Perry Park Road. They would set up out there and film the command post. They would go down and film searchers um, searching through the snow or whatever. So there was, a, there was a lot of media coverage of it. And just for the jury, uh, various acronyms, but what does PIO mean? What's oh, our for? public information officer. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sheriff's Office personnel assigned to uh, inform the media of specific cases. Okay. Was it a secret that law enforcement and various resources and personnel were in that area at any time? Absolutely not. Okay. And the media coverage in this particular area, um, they were there. Uh, was that being broadcast on the news to the public? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned also Highway 105, that some search efforts there were uh, also done. Was the media present to document that as well? Yeah, they, I, I think... I can recall pretty much every day we were searching media was somewhere I didn't pay a lot of attention to because I was in the command post, but people would call back in media on scene or media is in this area. Do you want them to go somewhere? Um, that was pretty common for most, most of the search days. Yeah. In terms of the scope and the number of resources that were used that you oversaw, is that anything that you'd ever seen before? Well, you worked at the sheriff's department for over 20 years. No, this was the biggest uh, search that I think anyone that I've worked with for 20 years has uh, been a part of. Thank you. Your Honor, we'll pass the witness. Cross examination. No questions, Charles. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Lieutenant Sarkissian? All right, looks like we have one. <coughs> Lieutenant Sarkisian, am I saying that right? That's closer. 
<laughs> what what would be right? <laughs> uh, Sarkeesian. Sarkeesian. Okay, I'm sorry. Lieutenant Sarkeesian, um, was the board on the west side of the barbed wire fence? Uh, yes, it was. And was there an opening in the fence? So, it, can we go back to can we go back to pictures? Tell me which one. Uh, yeah, that. Let's go back to this one first. So I'll, along here, no, this was a barbed wire fence all the way up, and then if you go to the further out picture, uh, right behind, basically behind this white truck, there's a break in the berm, and there was a barbed wire gate. So where the actual board was was a uh, there was no breaks in the barbed wire fence. And just for the purposes of the record, uh, Lieutenant Sarkeesian is using People's Exhibit 327 and before that, 328. And were there any footprints collected? Um, that I don't know as far as... Well, let me, let me rephrase that. The footprints in the area were from us searching extensively. So any of those footprints in the snow were from um, searchers, so to say, if that makes sense. Um, we had, like I said, we had anywhere from 30 to hundreds of people um, walking through there, uh, going through there. I do not believe that FBI collected any footprints from that area. All right. I will allow reasonable follow-up as to those questions only. Prosecution? <laughs> Uh, you mentioned footprints. Um, to be clear, had search efforts, volunteers, other personnel, had they been through that area by the time you saw that board? They had been. And, and not only that, I'll add, um, it had also snowed off and on, like I said, through that whole operational period. So there was, there was new snow on the ground. There was old snow. Um, obviously, as we walked in the snow, everyone was creating footprints, so... And in terms of looking for specific items or items of interest, was that information or directive relayed to the people that were helping out in the search? Uh, it was. Um, some, some specific items were relayed, but in general, like I said earlier, it was uh, any item that you know would spark your interest, um, call someone to come take a look at a little bit closer. And to be clear, when you approached that particular board, uh, was it clear to you that it had been moved um, by the snow or somebody had moved it in the snow? That someone had moved it in the snow? Somebody had moved it, what you observed but as it relates to the snow on the board. No, it had not been moved. All right. Briefly. Go ahead. Okay, so there were actually multiple footprints around that board, correct? Uh, not around the board, but kind of if you can imagine uh, between the berm and where the board was, there's kind of like a like a pathway, an alleyway, so to say, that's just um, would be, you know, you're not walking through the trees. So if you were going to walk that area, you would just walk through that opening. Um, there was footprints through that opening. Okay. And you didn't see who left those footprints? No idea. So you're just making the assumption that you believe that they were somebody from the search party? Well, search, uh, that was the zone we were in. So yeah. there were mul multiple searchers, the canines. Um, they were all in that area uh, moving through up and down over the, you know, through the berm. I mean, all through that area. Yeah, but you don't know for certain that none of those footprints were left by the person who left the board. I don't. Okay. No further questions. All right. All right. Thank you, Lieutenant. You may step down. Watch your step as you step off of the stain. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. I'm call Kevin Clark, Your Honor. All right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you surprised me. I was waiting for somebody to come in. Um, <laughs> if you would raise your right hand, uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand.
<clears throat> Who's doing, Kevin? Mr. Clark, um, remember you testified, I think it might have been last week, although it's kind of blending together. Um, still under oath, you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. And you've already been introduced to the jury, so I want to have you just jump into some specifics um, here. And, and we'll actually get into some of the stuff about the board in just a moment. But before we get into that, um, are you familiar with call detail records? I am, yes. What are call detail records? <laughs> call detail records are the activity the cell phone had with the cell phone carrier. So AT&T, Verizon, in this case, um, all the calls to and from the device, all the text messages to and from the device, the data sessions to and from the device, or uh, from the device to the network. All those have a date and a time that they occurred. And then phone number one, contacting phone number two. And if it's an inbound or outbound, that'll determine if it's your target number or not. And then it has the cell phone tower uh, and its location that service that activity for that phone to be able to make and receive calls, texts, data sessions. Is it common in investigations uh, for search warrants to be issued to phone companies like you mentioned, AT&T or Verizon, to obtain call detail records for specific types of phones? Every time. Um, <clears throat> how are those um, records used in an investigation in a general sense? It places or does not place a device in an area during a time period using the activity from the phone and the towers that service that activity. So um, basically for a phone, if it connects to a cell, t cell phone tower, does it somehow give, record I should say, a location data for that particular contact event? Yes. I'm gonna approach you with People's Exhibit 704 through 708. I've uh, previously shown these to the fence. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Clark, if you could just flip through those and then let me know when you're done flipping through those. I'm done. So uh, in a general sense, what are these items, disks? These are disks that contain uh, the call detail records and uh, the Life360 GPS location data for the cell phones belonging to individuals uh, in this investigation. Individuals that would be relevant towards this investigation? Correct. <clears throat> so for instance, none of these are for detectives or anything like that? No. Um, if we talk about People's Exhibit 704, um, tell the jury what People's Exhibit 704 is. Uh, 704 is a disc containing the AT&T call detail records for the defendant's cell phone. Um, we've heard testimony about two different phones um, associated with the defendant, one that was seized by law enforcement um, at the end of Detective Bethel's interview. Um, so I'll call that her Colorado phone. Is that this particular uh, disc? Yes, this is the Colorado phone. And then what is People's Exhibit 705? 705 is a disc containing the Life360 GPS location data for the Colorado phone belonging to the defendant. And so Life360, in a general sense, tell the jury what Life360 is. Life360 is, is an app, which is like a program that you can put on your phone, uh, as well as other phones. Uh, it can be friends or family. So you can see where uh, each other uh, phones are in near real time. And similar to cell phone data, do, does the Life360 disk that we have there, does that include that location data uh, for the defendant's phone using that Life360 app? It does. Um, People's Exhibit 706, tell the jury what that one is. These are the Verizon call detail records for the defendant's phone that was purchased um, on February 1st at the Trinidad Walmart that traveled to uh, Florida and then to South Carolina. And was that actually seized in South Carolina by law enforcement? We never seized the cell phone. Okay. Um, but use, how do you then get to the call detail records for that if the phone is never seized? Uh, these are completely independent of actually needing the physical phone. This is all the activity from the cell phone towers. So you don't need to have a physical phone to get this data. 
So does that come directly from Verizon as opposed to the physical device? That's correct. Um, People's Exhibit 707. These are the AT&T call detail records for Harley Hunt's cell phone. And then People's Exhibit 708. These are the AT&T call detail records for Gannon Stouk's cell phone. Do each one of those uh, discs that we just talked about, 704 through 708, do those include an affidavit from the provider? So AT&T, Verizon, Life360, verifying the authenticity of the information contained on those discs? They do. And at this time, I'd move for admission of people 704 through 708. Defense. No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 704 through 708 will be admitted. Okay. In preparation for the uh, next bit of testimony, Judge, I'm going to approach with People's Exhibit 694, which is a photo, and retrieve those other discs. Orange. So, Mr. Clark, we just heard testimony from uh, Lieutenant Sarkeesian regarding that board that was found up at the S-curve. In that general area that we're talking about, which is on the map there, I can't remember, what's the number of that exhibit number? In 326. Um, is that actually in southern Douglas County where this location is? It is. <clears throat> Are you familiar with that area? I am. Did you actually go up there and see some of this stuff yourself? I did. Um, I was up there with another FBI agent the day the board was, um, and at the time the board was located. Um, during this investigation, were you present um, for a, the vast majority of this investigation? I was. Um, in, in this area? Yes. Do you remember um, the, was there some location data, GPS data that we've already heard some testimony about that showed the GPS tracker that was placed on a vehicle traveling up to this area? There was. What date did that occur? Um, the first time was um, Tuesday evening, and the second time was Friday night of the week that Gannon went missing. Okay, so Tuesday evening, would that be January 28th? Correct. And then uh, the Friday night is which day? Uh, the uh, 30th. 30th? Okay. Or, or, yes. 30th or 31st? I can't. Friday's the 31st. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Friday the 31st. Um, subsequent to um, the GPS tracker data going up to this S-curve, do you remember um, if it snowed heavily after that? It did. Okay. And would that account for the drifting snow that we see in those pictures that we just looked at with uh, Lieutenant Sarkeesian? It would. Um, <clears throat> Did you have a chance to look at uh, the download of Mr. Al Stouk's phone? I did. <laughs> did that download include photographs that were taken using that phone? Yes. Uh, we previously admitted through Mr. Stouk, if we could pull up um, and republish people's exhibit number 34. Oh, we just need the screen turned on, Judge. Okay. Thank you. So we've got People's Exhibit 34 up behind you. Um, are you familiar with this picture? I am. Uh, tell us um, how you're familiar with this particular photo. When I was uh, examining uh, the download of Al Stouk's cell phone, I came across this photo. And seemingly, it, it, it's the desk that was uh, next to Gannon's bed in his bedroom underneath the window. Um, but then I also noticed uh, a board uh, on the garage floor. And so uh, when you came across this photo, um, were you able to tell when that particular photo was taken? Yes, there's something called metadata, and metadata is just a term for data about data. And in this case, it has a date and a timestamp of when the photo was taken. Data about data sounds like a really geeky thing. It, it really is, but it's, okay. it's useful geeky stuff. Okay. Uh, does that tell you when this particular photo was taken then? Yes. When, when was this photo taken? Um, sometime in... Um, November, December of 2019, if I, if I recall correctly. 2019 sound correct? Yes. Uh, had you when, you, when you came across this photo, when you're looking at Al's um, download data from his phone, had you already seen the board that was found up at the S-curve? Yes. Or at least photos of it? Yes. Uh, 
did that, uh, having that knowledge, did that cause you to have a particular interest in this photo? It did. Uh, what about seeing pictures of the board found at the S-curve made you key in on this specific photo? Um, the uh, broken corner, the top corner of the board. Uh, the board found at the S-curve also had a broken quarter, uh, corner, and it also appeared to be consistent of the, the, the type of the board, the, the particle board. Um, did you compare uh, the board in this photo to a photo of the board that was found at the S-curve? I did. Um, I've handed you People's Exhibit 694. Uh, what is 694? Uh, 694 is a side-by-side -side comparison of the board that was found at the S-curve and the board uh, zoomed in seen in this photo taken from Al's phone. And just to be clear, um, this particular photo that we see up there, People's Exhibit 34, is that the garage um, at 6627 Mandan Drive? It is. Um, is the photo 694, that side-by-side -side comparison, is that a fair and accurate representation of uh, your analysis and placing those two photos side-by-side -side to look at them in comparison? <clears throat> it is. And at this time, I'd move for admission of 694. No objection. Exhibit 694 will be admitted. Permission to publish. You may. Go ahead. We'll take just a second to scroll down. Ready. It's ready. Thank you. Now we got no signal. <laughs> Weird. Is there some data about data why there's no signal, Mr. Clark? I'll dig into it, sir. Okay. Oh, hold on. There we go. There we go. All right. Crisis averted. Yep. Uh, if you could use the pointer that's up there on, to your right, it's already extended, it looks like, uh, and make sure that the jurors can hear you in the, in the far reaches of the jury box. Point out the similarities between the board from the S-curve. Is that on the left side of this photo? Correct. I took this photograph right here on the left side. This is the board from the S-curve. Um, in the other photos that we saw of the S-curve, there was that reddish dark stain sort of in the middle that was sort of elongated. Is that on the flip side of this particular photo? It is. All right. So the picture um, taken inside the garage, is that on the right side of this particular comparison photo? It is. Point out for the jury um, the similarities between the two boards. One of the obvious ones is the broken, uh, in this instance, top left corner of the board, located at the S-curve, and then the one in the photograph. The second one that might be more difficult to see is there's a penciled X on this board. You see it here on the S-curve board. And you also see the bottom half of it right here in the garage board. And it's in the same location of the board. Officially, there's some uh, markings that go horizontal on the board in the photograph uh, with the uh, table saw on top, circular saw. And those same markings are seen here on the board that's recovered at the S-curve. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for uh, at this particular time, we will recall him later, Judge. All right. Mr. Cook, cross-examination. I just have a couple of questions. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Cook. Uh, did you take measurements of the board that was collected at the S-curve? I did not. Okay. So, like, width, length, anything like that? No. Okay. Um <laughs> I think that's all I have. Thank you. Redirect. Only very briefly. So the mentioning measurements, um, we could measure the board that was found at the S-curve, correct? Because we actually have that board. Yes. <clears throat> the board that's in the photo from the garage with that circular saw um, sitting on it, um, would it be easy to get measurements of that or would it be difficult? No, you can find the measurements of that, okay. that saw. Yes. Okay. Um, based on um, your observations of those two boards, does it appear that they are similar in size? Yes. Thank you. All right. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Mr. Clark on this subject? All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Prosecution, can you next witness, please? Paul, um, Commander Mitch Mahalko.
is doing law hall co. Commander, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear from the testimony about giving this man will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you. Go ahead and see in the stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? Well. Good. Will you please introduce yourself to the jury and then spell your first and last name for our court reporter? You bet. My name is Mitch Mahalko. Good morning. Um, I'm a commander with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. My last name is spelled M-I-H-A-L-K-O. First name Mitch, M-I-T-C-H. Thank you, Mr. Mahalko. Um, you said that you're a commander with the Sheriff's Office. How long have you been in that particular role? Uh, since 2021. How long have you worked at the Sheriff's Office in total? Uh, 20 years. Describe for the jury your various responsibilities through your career with the Sheriff's Office. Sure. Um, I've been uh, both on the detentions and law enforcement side. I've been a law enforcement officer on the law enforcement side since 2006. Uh, worked both as a, uh, a, a street uh, cop, uh, as a, a deputy, um, as a supervisor over both patrol and detectives. Um, I was a detective for about uh, nearly seven years. And uh, then from there, I had, I had uh, moved through the ranks to include uh, being a manager level or lieutenant and was recently promoted to commander in 2021. When you were a detective, what units were you assigned to in that role? So in, this, in the role as a detective, I was assigned to um, uh, financial crimes and um, uh, organized crime, and then uh, also uh, sex crimes or SVU. What kind of education do you have that allows you to do the job you do? Uh, so actually, I have a, an Associates uh, of uh, uh, Applied Science degree uh, in criminal justice. I also uh, hold a bachelor's degree in emergency services administration. What about post-certification, so uh, police officer standards and training certification? Yes, uh, in 2003, uh, I completed my post-certification as well. Meaning that you're a certified law enforcement officer in the state of Colorado? Yes. It's been a while? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what was your assignment back in January of 2020? Uh, January of 2020, I was a lieutenant uh, overseeing the violent crime section of the investigations division. What is the violent crime section of the investigations division? Uh, mainly person crimes. So uh, uh, everything from um, homicide, uh, sex assault, um, missing persons, cold case, uh, and, uh, and assaults. What is the jurisdiction of the sheriff's office? It may be obvious, but let's talk about that just sure. briefly. Jurisdiction is of all of El Paso County um, uh, to include incorporated. However, we, we, the actual operating jurisdiction is the unincorporated portions of El Paso County. So if, it, if something occurs within the city, do you pretty much leave that to Colorado Springs Police? Yes, we do. Uh, what, how did you become involved in or did you become involved in the investigation into Gain and Stout's disappearance? Uh, yes, uh, it was January 28th of uh, 2020. Uh, I was working within the division um, and actually contacted by Detective Sergeant Jake Abinshan. Um, Detective Sergeant Abinshan had uh, um, let me know that there was a, uh, a, uh, some information that had come in about a missing child um, and provided me with the initial brief on that. So as far as chain of command um, purposes, so we understand that, where did uh, Detective Sergeant Abinshan fit in that chain of command? Um, so Detective Sergeant Abinshan um, actually fell under uh, a, a different lieutenant, but uh, the three, there were three sergeants at the time within that uh, area, and all three sergeants worked as a, either on call or um, communicated uh, uh, concerning uh, different cases that would that were of interest to the investigations division. What was your role in that investigation? Um, initially, on January 28th, after I received the initial brief, um, I contacted uh, Detective Sergeant Hubble uh, because there were there were some concerning pieces of that brief to me, and I asked Detective Sergeant Hubble, who was the um, uh, major crimes or violent crimes sergeant at the time, uh, to begin the investigation and assign detectives. Um, when you are briefed on something, does that inform how you act as, a, as an investigator or how you use resources as an investigator? It does. So what were you briefed on um, from Detective Sergeant Hubble that was of concern to you and 
influenced how you proceeded from that point forward? Sure. Det Detective Sergeant Abinshan had briefed me uh, that on, on the 27th patrol, EPSO patrol had responded um, on a missing child. Um, as, as we dug a little bit further into it, he said that the child hadn't shown up at a friend's house. Um, he didn't have a history of running away. He was 11 years old and he uh, took uh, um, uh, medication for ADHD and that he was lightly clothed. So a number of those points were, were concerning to me, especially the age of the child, as well as um, uh, the fact that he was going from point A to point B and did not show up. Um, I didn't understand uh, why uh, initially uh, it was reported as a missing or as a uh, runaway child. And so um, I asked Detective Sergeant Hubble to assign detectives to it. What was it about um, having a missing child was causing you some concern or confusion? Uh, not knowing um, uh, or knowing that uh, such a young child who did not have um, resources such as uh, money, a phone, um, any of those things uh, uh, was, was out there and that he did not show up at a specific place, that was concerning to me um, because there, uh, uh, we didn't know the circumstances behind um, uh, the, uh, the reported runaway or, or missing child. As a lieutenant in violent crimes, did you at some point basically assume overall command uh, to designate resources going whichever direction were necessary at any given time? I did. So my response, my role and responsibility really is the is uh, a high level overseeing of the investigation. Um, the main uh, parts of the or the work that's being done are being done by detectives and being overseen by a supervisor or group of supervisors uh, working in in tandem. Give the jury a sense of the scope of this investigation as far as, uh, especially in these early days, uh, how many people were involved in it in a general sense and if other agencies got involved very early on. Sure. Um, initially, two detectives were assigned uh, to gather the initial information because, uh, again, we didn't know what um, uh, this case was. Uh, so as those detectives began um, investigating, uh, uh, getting information, um, the scope of the investigation began to grow. Um, and, and really the uh, the resources that are, are placed uh, towards an investigation uh, can expand or contract based upon the information that we receive. In this particular instance, um, uh, at, at any given point, the scope grew to include our entire investigations division, all of our detectives, and I'd, I would have to look back at, at how many that was uh, exactly. Um, uh, and including our, our uh, detective supervisors. So the entire investigations division were pouring their resources to include, include crime analysts um, into, uh, into the, uh, the investigation. Um, early on, uh, uh, we began speaking with uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the uh, supervisory agents um, at the FBI, uh, because again, not knowing what we had, uh, this, this investigation, could have been anything from a, a missing person to a, an abduction to, um, to any uh, number of things uh, or even a runaway. Uh, but at, 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 uh, um, within the first uh, week, probably day five or so, um, uh, we had been in contact with the FBI and requested resources from uh, the FBI. Were there also even people from the DA's office that were involved in that investigation, from investigators and even attorneys? Absolutely. Um, so uh, when we got to a point where, where uh, we believe that uh, uh, there uh, may be uh, some uh, criminality to the case, uh, we did uh, request some investigative as well as um, attorney resources from the DA's office. You mentioned that in the course of an investigation, um, investigative resources can either expand or contract. What determines whether that expansion of resource um, use expands or detracts, or retracts, I should say? So the investigation itself, um, the number of leads that we have to uh, apply resources to, uh, the depth of the investigation, um, and, uh, and the complexity of the investigation. So it could be anything from we have uh, um, 100 leads to 1,000 leads, and so we have to start assigning the, uh, the priority leads to uh, detectives. So that, that can very quickly take resources uh, from, from an investigation. The depth is also very important. Um, if there is technology involved, if there is um, uh, video 
or other things that need to be recovered. Uh, that takes time. In your experience, um, both as a detective and then in more of a command level um, responsibility, uh, can you give the jury a sense of how this investigation compares in scope to any other investigation you've ever done? This is the largest uh, in scope, uh, depth, and um, time, uh, focus time, I should say, that I have ever been uh, involved in. Were there um, area searches conducted um, in the early stages of this investigation to potentially locate a missing or lost child? Yes, there were multiple. Can you tell the jury just uh, some of those things? Yeah, so um, as, as we were, uh, as we gathered information as to possible whereabouts of Gannon, um, we, we applied uh, resources uh, to that. Uh, those resources actually were done in, in an instant command structure. So uh, Lieutenant John Bartesian was asked to head uh, the, the search efforts um, in conjunction with, with uh, multiple resources from um, our office and around the community. Um, uh, another lieutenant uh, that was working with me at the time, Lieutenant David Manzanilla, was um, tasked with being the liaison between the investigative and the uh, search function. Um, we searched... Uh, um, we searched multiple areas within El Paso County, uh, uh, whether it be uh, uh, within uh, lakes, uh, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, try that again, whether it be uh, uh, near um, um, areas of, of, uh, of water, whether it be uh, near um, areas uh, up north um, and uh, also areas down south, uh, we, we had multiple uh, search teams out working uh, that for many, many weeks. Let's, let's start initial stages of the investigation. Um, were the searches conducted around um, Gannon's home in that Lorison Ranch area? And was that the primary focus early on? Uh, they were. Uh, so with a, with a missing child or a, a runaway child, um, initially patrol will do an initial look at the house itself uh, and, and search for the child. We found missing children um, hiding within houses um, uh, nearby at, at other people's uh, air, uh, houses. Uh, so uh, initial area searches are very, very important. Um, I do know that there was an area search done uh, around the area to include the new uh, construction areas um, of... Uh, You're looking in those fields and ponds and that kind of thing. Was that largely determined based off of information that the defendant in this case was, was being... Uh, giving to investigators? Some of it. Some of it was generalized searches as well. As uh, expansion of search areas um, grows, including we just heard from Lieutenant Sarkeesian about the S-curve up in northern El Paso, southern uh, uh, Douglas County, how, was it, how were those areas developed and, and why were search efforts being given in those other areas? So uh, that area in particular um, was a lead that was uh, produced based upon um, techn technological information that was uh, provided or that was uh, um, uh, developed uh, to believe that the defendant was in that area. Okay. Initial um, stages of this investigation. So the, we've heard testimony already that the initial call comes in on uh, January 27th, Monday evening. And then you get notified on January 28th. In those initial um, stages, was foul play necessarily even suspected? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, at this point, we just knew that there was a, a missing child. As the investigation, investigation uh, advanced, did it become uh, more focused on the defendant in this case? It, over time, yes, it did. Okay. Were you able to observe, uh, and we've already heard testimony from Detective Bethel about her interview that she conducted of the defendant on January 29th. Did you observe that in that interview? I observed a portion of the interview, yes. Uh, the person that was being interviewed in that uh, interview, uh, did you have contact with that person? I did have contact uh, with the defendant. Uh, tell the jury about your contact with that, uh, with the defendant. So um, during that interview, uh, the defendant had had made uh, multiple statements that that were not um, congruent with uh, previous statements that she had made to deputies. Uh, that caused some concern. I do know that in that particular interview, uh, detectives had re had uh, been trying to get 
the defendant in for interview uh, for nearly uh, 24 hours or more um, uh, so, so we could uh, uh, gather some additional information. Um, it was very difficult to get the defendant into uh, um, uh, to contact uh, with our detectives. Um, in this particular case, as the as the interview was was coming to a close, uh, the defendant had said that she was she was uh, um, done with the interview, that she would come back at a later date or a later time or a later date, um, and then she tried uh, she wanted to she wanted to leave. Um, I had some concern because uh, I did note that she had been utilizing a cell phone, um, and I also knew that at the time she had been um, in contact with. Uh, Al, uh, her, her current husband at the time, and that there there were multiple text messages back and forth, or there was communication back and forth, I should say. Um, with the knowledge that uh, that the defendant was very difficult to get a hold of, the knowledge that um, she was probably the last person to that we knew of uh, to have seen Gannon, um, and with the knowledge uh, that there was. Um, conflicting stories uh, and that she had uh, essentially false reported saying one thing to uh, patrol deputies, another thing to our detectives. Um, that was of uh, significant concern. Um, knowing that uh, I, uh, I made contact with her and um, as I was talking to her, I asked if, uh, if the phone in her hand was her phone and if I could see it, she kind of held her hand out a little bit and I took a hold of the phone and I seized that phone. So I want to, um, First of all, uh, ask you, do you see that same person here in the courtroom today? I do. It is a defendant. Um, so be more specific, point, and describe clothing. You bet. Um, this is the defendant sitting between the, uh, her two attorneys. Uh, she has dark hair, um, wearing uh, white with a uh, dark pattern. You know, at this time, I'd ask that the record reflects he's identified the defendant. The record will so reflect. Go ahead. Thank you, Ron. So you mentioned um, having two different uh, versions being described, one to patrol and then one to detectives. Um, were these two different versions almost diametrically opposed to each other? Meaning the first one is missing slash runaway kid. And then the second one, as we saw in Detective Bethel, is a rape and an abduction. Absolutely. Yes. Did that cause you some concern? Yes, because that is not a normal thing. <clears throat> see that that kind of a difference in in uh, accounts talk to us about um uh, in your experience as a detective a, a person that's been in in uh, law enforcement for a, a, quite a number of years if you decide that you need to detain somebody or detain a piece of evidence um, pending a search warrant what is in your mind um to make those decisions and and why do you do it that way sure um so uh, with uh, with the this phone in in particular, um, as I had mentioned before, um, I knew that uh, the defendant was extremely difficult to get in for interview. Um, we did not really know where the defendant was and, and um, w was unable to uh, locate her easily. Um, uh, we did we did know that she had these diametrically different accounts, which was in my mind somewhat uh, um, indicative of of a of a suspicious uh, behavior. Um, we knew that um, she was in contact with uh, Al Stauk uh, uh, on a cellular device, and we also knew um, that that device was within her current possession. Um, I knew that that uh, if she had left with that cell phone um, uh, at that point in time, it was highly likely that it, that she had the opportunity to destroy uh, any information on there delete, um, maybe even uh, get rid of the entire device uh, completely. Um, and I took uh, the opportunity and I said, well, I took a look at that and I said, this was uh, an exigent circumstance. Um, so at that point, the phone was seized. Okay. So in your experience as a, both a detective and in your command level experience that you've got now, um, have you found over time that it's sometimes common to find evidence of crimes on p people's cell phones? Yes, cell phones are, are often used um, both to track uh, information, to track locations, um, uh, to search uh, for information as well. Um, do you find that uh, in today's day and age that people take their cell phones almost everywhere they go? Yes. Uh, were those things playing into your mind as to why this particular cell phone might be important to seize? Um, that exigency, potentially getting rid of the phone 
and the fact that it's likely that there might be something helpful towards the investigation on this device. Absolutely, yes. You know, may I approach with People's Exhibit 223? You may. Commander, if you could just take a moment and examine that item and let me know when you're done looking at, at it. Yes, sir. Do you recognize that item? I do. What do you recognize it as? Uh, this is a, a cellular telephone. It's a, it appears to be an iPhone with a white face, a teal um, uh, case, uh, and it appears uh, that this is the same device that I had seized from the defendant. And what about the evidence sticker? Does any of that tell you that information as well? Uh, the evidence sticker is uh, showing um, for this case, 2020-00001382, item number 26, barcode 1153747. Uh, this was submitted by uh, Detective Williams, um, and uh, it does show iPhone with teal and black case. Does this appear to be the same cell phone that you uh, seized from the, the defendant on that January 29th date? It does. Uh, does it appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition today as the day that you seized it? It does. Uh, there's also uh, just above the phone in that plastic display, a little uh, card. Tell, the, tell us what that is. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so, yes, it, it appears to be the, a SIM card. And my assumption is, is that it is a SIM card from the cellular device. Is it uh, very common to have a SIM card that actually plugs into each cell phone? to allow it to operate? Yes. You know, at this time, I'd move for admission of People's 223. No objection. Exhibit 223 will be admitted. Go ahead. When a cell phone is seized like that, um, what happens to it from an investigative um, standpoint? Um, the cell phone at, at that point is um, either powered down or placed in a Faraday bag, uh, so it cannot be um, tampered with remotely. Um, and then subsequently, uh, uh, in, in this particular instance, since there was not a search warrant to seize and search the phone, um, detectives uh, would have uh, applied for a warrant um, based upon probable cause to uh, search the cellular device. Uh, I'm looking for um, uh, digital evidence. So let's, let's uh, back up and just unpack that a little bit. You mentioned a Faraday bag. Uh, we may not all know what a Faraday bag is, so please describe that. Uh, that actually is a device uh, or a, a bag where we can put uh, a device into uh, that blocks any um, um, cellular waves. Signals. Signals. Um, so uh, to prevent um, somebody from accessing it uh, through cellular Correct. Uh, access points. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned uh, that there was not a search warrant yet obtained on this particular phone. Did somebody actually do that after the phone was seized? Yes, I do believe it was done. And as it relates to this investigation, was that eventually submitted to somebody that can uh, download the data from that particular phone? That is correct, yes. All right, and we've already had testimony on that from a different detective earlier. Um, there were a number of searches of 6627 Mandan Drive. Um, can you tell the jury why there were such a number of searches in this particular case? Um, in general uh, uh, reasons, um, please remember that uh, when, when this investigation began, um, the investigation began as uh, a, a runaway child. Um, as we developed further information, um, uh, we, we became uh, more convinced that the runaway portion of this uh, was um, inaccurate or a, a flat out lie. Um, we believe that now we were looking at either a missing person um, or some sort of uh, 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 criminality to, uh, to this case. Um, each and every time that we, um, that we connected and, and uh, searched the residence on Mandan Drive um, was prompted by an additional piece of information that as we were going through the investigation, we uncovered. Um, as nice as it would, it would be to, uh, to have all the information up front, it's not always plausible. And in, and in fact, um, we didn't even know if we had a, a, a child that was uh, alive or not um, as we were um, moving through the investigation. Uh, there were suspicions, um, but uh, this is, it's, it's not like it's a television show where we can complete it in 48 minutes. Okay. <clears throat>
So are you, were you familiar with searches um, being conducted on January 27th when patrol does their initial walkthrough after the 911 call and the non-emergency call was made by the defendant? Yes, that's a that's a common uh, thing by our patrol officers looking for a, a missing child or a, a runaway child. And then subsequent searches occurring on January 28th, January 29th, February 3rd, February 5th, February 13th, February 21st, and February 28th. Yes. Um, at some point, uh, did it become apparent that foul play had occurred inside the house? Yes, it did. When, when do you remember when that was? Um, I believe that that I mean we had we had um, suspicions because again without a body uh, uh, we were not a hundred percent certain initially um, and then as as we were looking um, and completing uh, investigations the uh, the leads took us in multiple directions but all of our information from each individual search we would, we would gather a piece of evidence um, uh, take a look at it and say hey there's there's something else going on here so it led us back to the house. I believe on February 7th uh, was, was the date that um, we applied for a warrant to actually seize the residence and hold the residence uh, for 14 days uh, the first time. And then we did a, a second warrant that held the, the residence for another 14 days because we, we were continuing to investigate and every lead that we uncovered um, uh, brought us back uh, to a piece of, uh, uh, of that house. So can you explain for the jury... Um why there's a the call for service on January 27th, and then uh, that warrant to seize the residence occurs on February 7th, as you just testified to. Why uh, why that gap in time? Why wasn't it initially locked down the very first day? Um, so uh, I, I would uh, each each of the teams that went out uh, again as the investigation was was unfolding, the teams initially went out looking for a miss or uh, for a runaway child. Uh, then uh, there was a uh, uh, um, uh, concern that the child was missing, endangered, um, that there may be foul play involved. And so every time that that, uh, that we went out, um, there were uh, different pieces of, of, of evidence that we were uh, looking for. Right around February 5th, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, there was uh, uh, indication that there was blood stain, blood staining and, um, that was uh, within the, uh, the bedroom of Gannon and that we actually com conducted a bloodstain pattern analysis um, on that date. Uh, on the 7th, uh, we, we seized and locked down the house because we kept, uh, uh, we kept finding that um, with additional interviews, with um, items of evidence that were being processed, uh, which be ended up becoming voluminous, um, that, that this uh, um, residence uh, needed to, uh, to be locked down and, and, and held. Mr. The, Allen, yes. Can you find a reasonable breaking point in the next five minutes or so. Now it's fine if you'd like, Judge. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our morning recess until 10 45. Uh, if I can have everyone back in the jury room at that point in time, we should be able to start right on time. Again, don't discuss case among yourselves. Don't discuss case with anyone else. With that, we'll see you back at 10 45. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Commander, if you want to step down, you can go ahead and do so. Court will be at least at 1045. All rise.
Jamie, can you get the stand or remind you, sir, that you're still under oath? And is there anything we need to take up at this point? No, you are. All right, let's go and bring the journey. <clears throat> All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May I be seated? Court will recall to the CR one three five eight People versus Letitia Stock. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Your Honor. So where we had last left off, um, Commander Malhalka, was we were talking about the different searches of the of the uh, six six two seven Mandan Drive. Um, I think you've you've testified that on February seventh is when the scene was officially locked down. I mean, what does that mean when you lock down a scene? Uh, so at that point, uh, detectives um, changed the locks on on the residents. Uh, they dis disabled the uh, the garage door, so they wouldn't be able, to, no one would be able to uh, access uh, the residents from the garage. Um, and uh, and we uh, we secured this, the uh, the house that way. How many um, homicide scenes have you responded to in your career, both as a detective and now as a uh, in leadership? Um, quite a few. Um, I can I can say uh, um, well into the 30s or more. Okay. <clears throat> in your um, experience as a detective and in in command, uh, if a if you have a homicide with no body, does that provide does that uh, create some difficulties in an investigation? Absolutely, it does. In what way? No, without without a no body uh, homicide, it's very difficult to uh, present probable cause that a, a homicide occurred. And so um, for the investigators, it takes a lot more uh, time and effort to uh, to uh, uh, show beyond uh, or to show a, a magistrate that there is probable cause um, that uh, the death of someone occurred. Um. Could there be a reasonable explanation that the person is just missing and not actually dead unless you have a body? That, that is a possibility. So that's uh, one of the hurdles uh, in a, in a no-body homicide investigation that you have to overcome because um, it could just be a, a someone that uh, was missing, um, period. In your experience, both as a detective and then in command level, uh, is there a lot of evidence that you can derive from a body that's um, had some violence carried out on it? Yes, there's uh, um, obviously physical evidence, uh, the, the method of, um, of death, um, uh, potentially um, a, a generalized timeline, um, and uh, depending upon what evidence is found on scene, there, that could uh, uh, produce multiple leads. When you respond out to a homicide scene and, and a body is still on scene, is it very typical to find bodily fluids on the scene? It is uh, distinctly possible, yes. Like blood? Mm -hmm. um, you have to say yes or no for the court report. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, potentially um, body tissue even? Yes. Um, are those things helpful to, deri to drive where an investigation goes and how it develops? Uh, yes, it does help us with uh, determining method. And uh, um, dependent upon the scene, 
um, that evidence can also uh, help lead us to uh, potential um, directions and suspects. Did you, in fact, ever go to 6627 Main Dan Drive yourself? I did. Did you see things inside that house that led you to believe, based on your training and experience, that a um, something violent had occurred inside that home? Yes, I did. I what were that. those things? Um, we saw blood uh, patterning, a blood stain patterning, um, blood stain, um, blood staining uh, within the uh, room of uh, Gannon Stop. Um, when you say blood patterning, um, are you talking about blood stain pattern? Yes. Uh, where was that generally located? Um, on uh, a wall, and I don't remember which direction of, of the wall, but on a wall that was near uh, where Gannon's bed was uh, was previously located. Um, did you also have a chance to observe um, where blood had seeped through carpet and puddled onto the concrete underfloor? Yes, I did. Uh, did it appear that there had been a fairly large amount of uh, blood that had seeped through that and stained that floor? Yes, it appeared that there was a significant event there. Um, having that sort of uh, seeping through and puddling, is that consistent with other murder scenes that you've been on? Yes. In an ideal world, um, if you know that a crime has been committed inside of a house, um, do you prefer to seize that and prevent people from going into a scene right at the very get-go? Yes. Why is that? Um, because uh, any uh, anyone moving in or out um, may inadvertently uh, uh, move evidence around or transfer um, uh, pieces of, of uh, evidence uh, from one place to another. So we've already talked about um, the, the phone call coming in on January 27th, and then the scene is not locked down until February 7th. So we're talking a number of days. Uh, did you have concerns with that span of time from a command level and from your experience about that scene being compromised at all? Um, from, the, from the time as the investigation unfolded, uh, I believe that the investigative teams uh, were um, acting appropriately and, um, and uh, searching for the evidence that was necessary. But as, as additional information came to light, um, that caused us to have to go back. So as of February 7th, we, we um, uh, determined and realized that the um, scene itself needed to be locked down, which is what we, uh, what we did. As this case developed and days after days uh, rolled along, did it become less likely that Gannon was going to show up alive? Yes. Um, were you developing uh, investigative leads that were acted on and evidence being found like on the S-curve, like we heard from uh, Lieutenant Sarkeesian. Yes, and um, please please remember, I mean, th this, this was a team of investigators that was not only following um, leads uh, that, that were generated with the defendant uh, as, as a potential suspect, but we had um, hundreds, if not a thousand plus tips that uh, detectives also had to uh, uh, vet and determine um, if, if there was direction uh, that we need to take on those as well. During the pendency of the investigation phase of this particular case, <clears throat> were there daily meetings um, starting with the sheriff's office and then did that evolve eventually to the FBI's building? Yes, those meetings were sometimes uh, once, sometimes uh, twice per day. Uh, were, they, were a lot of people involved in those meetings? Um, the, the key uh, investigators uh, uh, again, at the same time, we still had uh, investigators in the field, but the key investigators were there, and um, most of the information was uh, was disseminated that same day to the rest of the team, yes. And then was information that was passed along in those meetings acted on each day uh, by different investigative teams, um, both locally and then eventually nationally? Yes. You mentioned earlier... You had concerns um, about the uh, defendant's behavior, and that sort of informed you as to why you wanted to seize her phone on January 29th. Um, in your experience and training, uh, was she cooperating with the investigation? No. Uh, was she acting as a typical um, parent or step-parent would in a missing kid case? Definitely not. Um, when we're talking about was she acting normal um, based on your training and experience, uh, did you have the opportunity to observe her um, at different times? Um, I did. Uh, uh, well, uh, mainly 
uh, uh, during interview. Um, and so uh, uh, during uh, the interview uh, on uh, the 29th of January was the first time that I actually uh, was able to observe the defendant. Um, and then uh, I did observe uh, some of her interactions with media. Um, and uh, we, we were also very closely monitoring um, social media at the same time. Okay. And so when I am asking you questions like, um, was she acting normal compared to other missing kid cases? Um, was she acting in a way that caused you any concern during the times that you could observe her um, that she was not sane? That she was not sane? Right. That, no. that, that she was insane? No. Did it ever get anywhere close to that in the observation periods that you had of her? No. What, what it appeared to me was, uh, um, as, as the information developed, it appeared to me uh, that the defendant was very um, cognizant of what was occurring and took specific steps, almost being methodical in um, misdirecting and redirecting investigative efforts. Did those efforts, in fact, cause the investigation to be manipulated, especially early on, um, away from the crime scene? Absolutely, yes. You have just a moment, Your Honor. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you. Mr. Pope. Commander, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Will Cook, and I'm sure you can tell by now I represent Ms. Stalk. Um, so this was originally a missing uh, child and uh, or originally was a possible runaway, but then became a missing child. What, what day or what time was that where this switch took place from runaway to a missing child? I couldn't give you the exact date and time. Um, it would be within the first couple of days officially. Uh, it went from a runaway to a missing endangered. And did you make that determination to? I did. Okay. <clears throat> now we watched several hours of Detective Bethel um, and the other detective interviewing Miss Stalk and saw the incident where the phone is seized by you and uh, we saw that on video. Uh, when you say she held it out, did you ask for the phone or did you just grab it from her? Um, I believe that I had asked her if, if that was uh, her phone and if I could see it. She held it out slightly. I took control of it. And at that point, she clasped her hand around it. And I did take, I did physically take it from okay. her. Okay. Yes. And this was on January 29th, 2020? Yes. Okay. Sometime in the afternoon? Uh, yes. Okay. And this was at the, um, just right across the street from the courthouse? Yes, sir. The command, w what is that building referred to? It's the called the o Office of the Sheriff, or uh, commonly known as OTS. It's at 27 East Vermont Avenue. Okay. <laughs> and during the interview, you had been watching some of this interview going on in a different room? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you had been doing some other things as well? Okay. While the interview was going on? Yes. It looked like at one point uh, you said in your report that you had been talking to Sergeant Rocky Hubble and doing some other things and would come back and look at look in and see what was going on. Would that That's be correct. a fair statement? Okay. Generally, uh, from uh, a lieutenant level, uh, that is uh, something that uh, as, I'm, as I'm being briefed, either by detectives or sergeants, um, uh, I, will, I would be multitasking uh, during a, an interview like that. Okay. So, Gannon, just kind of a timeline as, as far as you know, January 27th, 2020, Gannon is reported missing or run away by Ms. Stalk in the evening, correct? Yes. Okay. On the 28th of January of that year, uh, Gannon's father comes back into town and there is a meeting at a Starbucks in the evening between Miss Stout and Al Stout, Gannon's father. I'm unclear as to the exact timeline on that, um, so I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. But then um, the 29th, we've already talked about, that's when she went down and did the video recorded interview and her phone was seized. And then on February the 7th is when the seizure of the home 
at Mandan Drive took place. That's correct. Okay. Now, from the 29th to the 7th, which is when she did the interview, uh, to the 7th, that's about, what, eight or nine days that went by between the seizure of the phone and the seizure of the house? Have you done the math on that? 29, 30. <laughs> I'm not very good at it, but I, I think eight or nine days. Okay. But would you say from the January 29th to February 7th, there's eight or nine days between the seizure of the phone at the police or the deputies uh, station where you took it from her to where the house at Mandan drive was seized. Yes. And multiple um, uh, warrants uh, executed at the house as well. Okay. And you already told Mr. Allen, while it's important to uh, have a crime scene or a possible crime scene locked down because evidence can disappear. It can be tainted. It can be destroyed, contaminated, all these other things. Is that correct? There's a possibility of that, yeah. yes. And that's why you seized the phone you testified to because she could have destroyed the evidence, uh, uh, gotten rid of the phone, whatever. A lot of stuff could happen. And so that's why it was important, exigent circumstances, that you took this phone, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And ultimately, that's why you seized the house on February 7th to keep evidence from leaving, disappearing, uh, spoiling, whatever you want to call it. Uh, once it was determined uh, that the uh, that the house is was a uh, uh, a point that we kept coming back to um, and realized that the investigative efforts were very complex and um, were ongoing and continuing. Uh, yes, that decision was made. OK. Now, on January 27th or 29th, I'm sorry, during the interview, you made a determination that there was exigent circumstances to take the phone to seize it. Uh, for Ms. Stauk, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You also base that determination on the fact that uh, she had really changed her story. And as Mr. Allen asked you, uh, first story was diametrically opposed to what second story was, correct? Yes. Okay. At that time, uh, you could have arrested her for attempt to influence a public servant, correct? Um, giving the vastly diametrically opposed stories to law enforcement. Uh, remember, uh, uh, at this point in time, we also uh, had no body, and um, there was there was concern uh, that that there were additional leads coming in. So, um, is there was a there was a possibility that was a concern? Yes. Okay. Enough to where you were able to seize a phone of Ms. Stauk uh, into the possible investigation of Gannon's disappearance. Correct. And I'm not talking about, you know, charging her with murder at the time. I'm talking about attempt to influence the public servants. Sure. Why didn't you charge her then? You, you said in your report that we believed she was giving false information. I believed that this went into the calculus about making your decision. Um, of seizing the phone. Why didn't you just go ahead and charge her with something then and arrest her? What would that have uh, gained for the actual investigation into Gannon at that point? Uh, well, it would, I, I can't answer the questions. Good. So, I mean, if, that, if, if that's a, just a rhetorical question for the jury. So I, I, more of a clarifying question as to where you're going with that. I'm trying to, I would like to help you with that. Well, uh, Commander, there's information that uh, after the 29th, but before the house was locked down on the February 7th, that Ms. Stauk and her family had arrived at the Mandan Drive house with a moving van and moved out of the residence, correct? Um, I don't remember the exact dates, but there was a timeline in there that, that they did move, yes. It was between her interview on January 29th and um, but after that, but before the house was seized on February 7th, correct? Yes. Okay. And also there's allegations and evidence that has come in that actually Ms. Stouch, Stouch, after January 29th, 
um, after the interview and the phone seizure, transported Gannon's body to Florida and uh, dumped it in uh, a swampy area. That happened after January 29th, but before February 7th, the house being seized, correct? Um, not sure exactly when, when that occurred, but again, I, I would have to actually go back to reports to see the exact timeline. I apologize. I'm not able to give a more clear answer on that. Uh, if you're, if you're, stip if you're telling me that that uh, is what your understanding is, um, I can, I could agree to, uh, that likely be the case. If she had been arrested on January 29th, uh, at the police station when the phone was seized, uh, then she would have been in custody and not had the opportunity uh, the first week of February to dispose of Gannon's body in Florida, correct? Um, I can't make that uh, that determination, especially within our jurisdiction. Um, a, uh, uh, a false reporting is actually a misdemeanor crime, which you would be served a summons. And uh, so she would never have been uh, arrested and, and placed into custody. Um, if there was enough information for a felony, attempt to influence that is a very low bond and generally something that uh, people are out on uh, extremely quickly. But attempt to influence, uh, this would have qualified and it is a felony offense. And she could have had a bond set much higher if it was an uh, attempt to influence as part of a high profile murder investigation. You could have asked for a higher bond, correct? Um, again, I believe that at this point in time, you're, you're making an assumption that on January 29th, we were able to prove or um, or have more than a, uh, a suspicion that Gannon was murdered by uh, uh, his uh, stepmother. Um, so I think that, that that's reaching. All right. Can I have just a second, Your Honor? You may. Go ahead. That's all I have. Thank you. Redirect. So just to be clear, did you seize the defendant's phone? I did. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, to make an arrest in a felony case, what do you have to have? Probable cause. What does probable cause mean? Probable cause is a set of circumstances that um, would lead a, a reasonable magistrate or judge um, uh, or even uh, uh, to, to believe that uh, a crime has occurred and the person that you're arresting committed that crime. Can you arrest somebody on mere suspicion? No. Uh, can you arrest somebody just because a child is missing? No. Um, did you have probable cause on January 29th to arrest the defendant? No. Um, when a arrest warrant was issued in early March of 2020, is that when probable cause had been achieved and an arrest warrant issued? Yes. Uh, did that unfortunately um, not prevent Gannon's remains from being transported from Colorado to Pensacola, Florida? Unfortunately, it did not. Uh, the fact that um, Gannon's remains were found 1,300 miles away from Colorado Springs, was that indicative of a very calculated move by whoever moved Gannon's remains from here to there? I believe it was. Um, requiring driving on lots of roads and following laws? Absolutely, and ensuring that uh, the transport of a human body uh, was concealed extremely well from anyone um, who uh, uh, may have had contact with that person. And the fact that, uh, were you familiar with um, the location where Gannon's remains were ultimately found? Uh, I, I, do, I, don't, I wasn't personally familiar with it, but yes, I do know where, where it occurred. Okay. Um, the fact that his body was found thrown over the edge of a bridge, um, is that also indicative of um, somebody trying to hide um, valuable evidence in a homicide investigation? Uh, especially 1,300 miles from uh, the, the reported missing uh, location, yes. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Commander Mahalko? All right, Commander, you may step down. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Prosecution, call you next one, then, please. In the, oh. Oh, yeah. Alyssa Berry's for your honor. Just put it right there. Um, just yet. Ma'am, would you step forward, please, and raise your right hand? 
you swear from the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. So, if that seat in your witness stand, please watch your step as you step into the stand. And, Judge, just as a preliminary matter, before we get into Ms. Berryford's testimony, we have quite a number of photos that we're going to be admitting through her. It's basically uh, 528 through 678. Um, and to be efficient, I've asked defense if they will stipulate to admission of those items uh, so that we can just jump into her testimony. So I would move for admission of 528 through that uh, last number, which was 678. 678. Thank you. That's, That's fine, Your Honor. All right. No objection. Exhibits, five, uh, exhibits 528 through 678 will be admitted. Go ahead. And just before I get into the testimony, I want to put these up here on the. Uh, That's fine. That's all of them. Uh, there are some from a different witness in here, uh, but those get really slippery in these sleeves if I take them out of here. No, right. that's fine. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. How are you doing? <laughs> Good morning. I'm well. Will you please introduce yourself to our jury and then spell your first and last name for the court reporter? My name is Alyssa Berrysford, B as in boy, E as in Edward, R, R, I, E, S as in Sam, F as in Frank, O, R, D. Uh, Ms. Berrysford, um, what do you do for a living? I am a senior crime scene investigator and the technical unit lead for the crime scene unit for the Colorado Springs Metro Crime Lab. What does a, crime scene, a senior crime scene investigator do? A senior crime scene investigator has all of the same duties as a regular crime scene investigator, only we have the opportunity to also study and um, practice an additional forensic discipline. What education do you have that allows you to do your job? I have a bachelor's in chemistry with a criminalistics concentration from the Metropolitan State University of Denver. Upon being hired, I completed an internal training program where I was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for six months. During that time, I responded to everything, crime scenes, vehicles, autopsies, person processings, all with a qualified crime scene investigator. And in addition to that, I have had the opportunity to attend several training classes in topics like crime scene investigation, shooting incident documentation, and bloodstain pattern analysis. Do you have any professional affiliations? Yes, I am a member of several um, forensic associations um, to include the International Association of Identification, otherwise known as the IAI, and the International Association for Bloodstain Pattern Analysts. Do you also participate in continuing education to make sure you stay sharp and abreast of any new developments in technology or training? I do. Tell the jury about some of that stuff. Um, over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to attend a couple of conferences um, put on by these associations. Um, so I attended the International Association for Identification Conference, as well as the International Association for Bloodstain Pattern Analyst Conference, um, which is really a good opportunity for kind of a meeting of the minds because a lot of people will bring um, research and new emerging technology and present it at these conferences. Have you testified as a court qualified expert witness? I have. How many times? 20 times. In what uh, disciplines have you testified as an expert? Uh, crime scene investigation, crime scene processing, evidence collection, trajectory documentation, and bloodstain pattern analysis analysis. Okay. In what jurisdictions? Uh, the fourth region. Fourth Judicial. So El Paso and Tel have you also done Teller County or just El Paso County? Just El Paso. Okay. You know, at this time I would move to qualify Ms. Berriesford as an expert witness in bloodstain pattern analysis pursuant to her qualifications. Defense. No objection. The witness will be so qualified. Go ahead. I want to lay some groundwork through you um, so that we have some understanding as to what we're talking about. Do you typically use Blue Star um, in your um, I'm seeing processing in, in development of bloodstain pattern analysis. It's not used very often in bloodstain pattern analysis, um, but we do use it frequently when we have an indication that the bloodstains may have been cleaned up because it is a search tool for those latent or hidden bloodstains. Does latent just mean hidden? Yes. Okay. 
Do you use low light photography um, when you're using Blue Star? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with the phrase road mapping technique? I am. What does that mean? Road mapping is a technique used to document blood stains, especially when a blood stain pattern analysis may be conducted later on down the line. Um, what it entails is a lot of extra documentation. We're going to identify specific pattern types um, for those blood stains and then add in a lot more directionality and scales um, when we're doing the documentation itself. When you say pattern types, what do we mean by that? So blood stain pattern analysis is based off of a series of different pattern types. And what I mean by that is um, different mechanisms can produce different appearing blood stains. And based upon the appearance of those blood stains, the size, shape, location, distribution, orientation, it can tell me different things about what may have caused those blood stains to be deposited. Okay. And so tell the, to the, the jury about, I guess, some of those different types, for instance, a transfer blood stain. What does that mean? So a transfer stain is going to be when a bloody object comes into contact with an object that does not have blood on it, therefore transferring that blood from one thing to another. So if somebody had blood on their hand and touched a table and wiped it, would that be a transfer stain? Correct. Uh, what about expirated um, blood stain pattern? So expiration refers to blood in an airway. Um, it is indicative or you can tell that it's expiration if there are air bubbles um, within the blood. If there is maybe a little bit of extra liquid to it, like um, spit, saliva, maybe nasal mucus. Um, but you have to have an injury to the airway in order to classify it as an expiration stain. So correct me in my terminology here, but if, if there's like an arterial bleed where blood is spurting, what kind of stain would that potentially cause? That would be a spurt stain. Okay. So <laughs> tell the jury about that. Um, so arterial um, or arteries are very unique because they're very pressurized and they're very high volume of blood, which means that if an artery is nicked or severed, we're going to have a very high volume of blood that's ejected under pressure. Um, so this is going to create a very unique blood stain. Typically, what we're seeing are very large circular or elliptical stains um, with a lot of volume in them. If um, somebody is has a heavily bleeding head wound and is laying, say, on the floor here, uh, and it's seeping onto the floor, what kind of stain would that be? Um, depending upon the surface of the floor, it would either be a blood pool where the blood is just flowing out and it's um, only gravity is acting upon it. Um, or if it's a porous surface like carpet, it's going to be a saturation stain. So if you think of you've got a spill on your counter and you take a paper towel and wipe it up and that liquid um, seeps into the paper towel, that's saturating the paper towel. Can you have both a saturation stain and a pooling stain in a in one single event? Yes. Meaning that blood seeped, uh, saturated through carpet and then seeped into a pool area? Correct. How useful is uh, blood stain pattern analysis in a criminal investigation? Blood stain pattern analysis is typically used when we don't know what happened. Um, because there's information that can be gained from bloodstain patterns, um, we typically employ it when we need to know what the story was or if what our witnesses are telling us doesn't match up to what we're seeing on scene. Um, bloodstain pattern analysis can be used to determine what kind of mechanisms created the bloodstain patterns maybe a sequence of events or even the location of that blood source or injury within the scene. What about, um, can you to determine to some level the amount of energy used uh, that caused a, a blood pattern to exist? Not necessarily in degrees of, of velocity or force. Okay. Um, what are some limitations with blood stain pattern analysis? Well, we can only work with what we see in front of us. So if all of the bloodstain patterns aren't there, um, then we won't have the full, 
the full picture and we won't be able to tell the full story. Um, some other limitations are mostly documentation um, in the sense of if we don't have good photographs, um, if we don't have good diagramming, then for an analyst, it's going to be very difficult to try and go through all of that and make determinations. Um, on top of that, depending upon what investigative question is trying to be answered, um, we may want DNA analysis to be done on those blood stains so that we can link the pattern or mechanism with an individual. Um, when you are looking at a potential blood stain pattern um, for analysis, um, can you sometimes see that there's been some effort to clean a particular area, potential clean blood stain patterns? Yes. What do you see when you're, uh, that tells you those types of things? Um, in most cases, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but the blood itself, once it's dried, is actually very hard to clean up. Um, it doesn't just wipe up very easily. And so that blood becomes more dilute, uh, more transparent, lighter in color um, as you attempt to clean it up. And the well-defined edges of those blood stain patterns start to blur. Um, so that's an indication that it's been altered in some form. Um, if, say, we're, we're talking about a wall and there's a, a high volume of blood on a wall and then water or some cleaning agent is added to that blood stain, will that cause the blood stain to actually run down the wall? It can. Can it cause it to run behind uh, light sockets or um, switches or anything like that? Absolutely. Uh, can it cause it to eventually pool on a flat surface below that particular wall? If enough liquid is supplied, yes. Can you actually um, sometimes see any uh, wiping uh, marks or what would appear to be white marks on blood stains? You can, yes. Are there any other things that can um, sort of go along those same ideas of uh, indi indicative of cleaning a, a blood stain pattern? Not necessarily that. I think okay. pretty much covers it. And I, it wasn't a trick question. I just truly didn't know. <laughs> uh, you talked about um, in the limitations portion of it um, that if, if information is missing, does cleaning a blood scene remove information that would have been helpful if it had existed at the time that you show up? Absolutely. I want to talk specifically now about the case that you're here testifying on. Um, how did you become involved in the investigation into Gannon Stalk's disappearance? Um, I was initially requested to um, respond on February 3rd to the El Pormar Youth Sports Complex to investigate a, a potential clandestine grave. So uh, the El Pomar Youth Sports Complex down south, not too far from the sheriff's office, correct? I mean, the uh, jail, I should say. Correct. Um, is it typical um, to respond to those types of scenes if you don't know where a body might be? Yes. Uh, did it turn out whether this clandestine grave was associated with this case or not associated? It was not associated. So how do you know that? Uh, because it ended up just being a pile of dirt. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then what else did you do? Did you get a uh, request to go out to the actual home on February 5th? Yes. What was the nature of that request? I was requested to respond and document uh, visible blood stains that were found uh, within the residence. And what was the address of that residence? 6627 Mandan Drive. Tell the jury, um, you don't just jump in and start going crazy, do you? No. So tell the jury what the process is. Uh, when you first arrive at a scene like at this 6627 Mandan Drive? Whenever we respond to process a scene, we are always going to get some sort of briefing from the detectives or law enforcement personnel present on scene. That's going to kind of give us some information, maybe what we're looking for. Um, they have, at that point, hopefully conducted interviews, so there may be some critical pieces of information. Once we've gotten our briefing, we're going to conduct a walkthrough where all we're doing is getting our bearings, looking through the scene, kind of developing our plan of attack on how we're going to process the scene. After that, we're going to process the scene from the exterior moving inwards, using the least intrusive methods and going more intrusive um, as we progress throughout the scene processing. So when you say least intrusive to more intrusive, is that basically you start out with a wide aperture 
And then you really get tight focus as you start to get into specific things that are of importance. In some cases, yes. Okay. So what was the focus of your um, processing on February 5th? February 5th, I was solely focused on the Southeast basement bedroom and the visible blood stains located within. And we've already got the photos up there and admitted, um, again, a big number of, of items, 528 through uh, 678 in the binder sitting in front of you. Um, did you take all of those photos? Probably. I think I could have saved us some time. Are those all <laughs> photos taken um, of the scene that you processed on February 5th of 2020? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did the uh, bloodstain pattern that you were examining on that particular day include two walls, baseboards, and floor area? Yes. Um, what general walls are we talking about um, for your processing on February 5th? The south and the east walls in the southeast corner of the room. Okay. Do you somehow label the different areas so that you can keep track of um, which areas you're talking about or taking photographs of to document them? Yes. How do you do that? Um, in this case, I chose to label all of the stains found on the walls under um, the identifier of A. So every stain was A1, A2, all the way up to A54. And then the baseboards had the identifier of B, and I had B1 through B5. And then did you also, and so do you do that with a placard? Do you actually put a placard of placard A on certain surfaces, placard B on certain surfaces? Yes. Did you also have a placard C? I did. What was placard C? Placard C was a potential blood stain that was located on the, the window screen in the room. Okay. When you're uh, processing a scene like this, is it typical that you might also take swabs of different samples? Absolutely. Why do you do that? Um, we will take swabs so that when we're documenting it, and if they're um, then later on down the line, we can say, hey, this stain was this person. Okay. How do you do that swab process? Um, depending upon the size of the stain, we're either going to use one or two basically Q-tips. We're going to wet it with distilled water and rub it against the surface to pick up the um, substance. Um, we'll then package it in its own packaging and it moves on down the line until it's submitted into evidence. Those Q-tips that you're referencing, are they sealed before you use them? Yes. Why is that? Um, we want them to be sterile. That way we're not introducing any additional potential contamination. And then once you get done collecting a swab, so you rub it on a particular surface or stain, do you seal them again so that they also can't be contaminated after the fact? Yes. Did you um, swab any particular areas in this particular case? I did. How many different swabs did you take? I collected 10 swabs. Um, did you use that same exact process you just described? I did. And then did you actually submit those into evidence for sub subsequent um, lab testing if necessary? I did. What were your impressions of this particular scene? Um, when I first walked in, I couldn't see any of the bloodstains. Um, it wasn't until we got pretty close to the wall um, and we were really, really looking for them that we found them. And after we had identified them, which um, it took about an hour and a half to go through and identify all of those um, tiny little bloodstains, uh, it definitely was not a static event. Um, there was something dynamic that happened there um, more than just a single event um, within that room. What do you mean by that? I've been to crime scenes with a single gunshot wound that has no blood. I've been to crime scenes with a few stab wounds that have no blood. Um, to have blood at that scale and of those types of patterns 
um, there has to be some movement within that scene. Um, so some object with blood, whether it's um, the blood source itself, um, impact events, or a bloody object being swung, um, was present within that room. Would it be helpful for you to explain what you're talking about to put a particular photo up on the screen so the jury can see sort of what you're describing? And I'm going to rely on your expertise to tell me which one would be best to help describe what you just talked about. Sure. Have we seen photographs of the wall prior to labels? Not with labels, no. Not with labels, okay. Um, let's go with People's Exhibit 540. Okay. Give us just a minute to scroll through to that <laughs> number. And permission to publish, Judge, as I um, see fit during the testimony of Ms. Barrysford. Okay, so we've got 540 on the board behind you. Um, you can either describe what you're looking at in the photo that's on the table in front of you, or if you want to point out things on this wall, use the pointer that should be up there in the witness stand somewhere. Got it. Okay. Um, so this photograph is an overall photograph of the bedroom after all of the stains have been identified. Um, so you can see in this photograph, there's those little black rectangles. Those are each going to identify a minimum of one spatter stain. And by spatter stain, I mean a circular or elliptical stain that is produced by some external force being applied to liquid blood, whether that's on a surface or from an injury itself. Um, so this kind of shows the magnitude of those spatter stains. It reached fairly far. Um, we have a height of five to six feet um, tall, and it spanned on the, I believe that's the east wall, um, at least six feet um, down the wall. So this isn't just one area. There's some movement involved with this. So let's, let's um, dig into this photo just a little bit. There's the white uh, on that, I'm sorry, the, the yellow that stretches through both walls on that um, south and then east wall as well. Yes. Um, what is that yellow stuff there? Uh, that is road mapping tape. So that is part of our road mapping documentation. Um, and that allows a blood stain pattern analyst to look at a stain, reference the um, scale tape and say this stain was approximately five feet high. Are all of the blood stains um, that you looked at for this particular case, with the exception of the window, um, all contained below and with inside of that yellow border um, road mapping tape? There is one additional stain that is, if I may, may I yeah, stand? Yeah, absolutely. Just make sure when you stand up because you're away from the microphone that the furthest juror can hear you. Um, so there is a stain that is just past the reaches of the um, scale tape, and it's going to be on the baseboard kind of over here on the lower left-hand corner of the photograph. And I'm going to have you stay there for just a moment. Um, all of those white rectangular stickers, are those your evidence stickers that you placed that are below and inside of that yellow road mapping tape? Yes. What about the white things that we see above the road mapping tape? Uh, those are wall decorations that were there prior to my arrival. So those have nothing to do with your analysis of this scene, correct? Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, the height and uh, I'm going to use the word enormity. Did that surprise you for this particular scene? It all? did. Why? Um, at that point, we really had no indication of what the cause of death could be. Um, so something like this is a lot more, for lack of a better word, violent than I expected to see. Um, did this indicate to you that there had been a significant bloodletting that occurred in this bedroom? Yes. Did these stains lend themselves to one pattern? We talked about the other patterns earlier. Um, did these lend to one pattern or were there multiple different patterns potentially? So because of the cleaning that was involved, um, we really couldn't say that it was from a specific pattern. 
Um, if you think of a photograph, which is made up of a lot of tiny little pixels, um, right? If you have all of the pixels together, you can see what the picture is um, and what it means. If you only have 50 pixels and they're randomly spread across a photograph, you're not going to be able to tell what may actually be in that photo. Were there um, some of these blood stains that showed potentially different directionality? Yes. Can you show us a couple of examples of that uh, just so that we understand what you're talking about? And then again, just tell me which uh, exhibit number would be best to, for you to point to for that. Exhibit 572. Okay, so let's publish 572. Okay, so we've got 572 displayed on the screen behind you. And again, if it might be best to just stand up and point to different things so that the jury can see what it is you're talking about. What is it that we're looking at in 572? <laughs> So in this photograph, there are three or four uh, tiny little spatter stains. Um, so these are going to be um, this one here down at the bottom. We have two near the scale sticker and then one a little bit farther out. Now for spatter stains, especially elliptical spatter stains, we can usually tell directionality based off of what we call the tail. Um, so as blood hits a surface, it's going to elongate, and then kind of what's left over is going to create what looks like a tail, and that's gonna tell us the direction it was moving. In this specific photograph, we have a couple of different directionalities. Um, so this lower stain is going to have a downward directionality. You can see it comes to a point there at the bottom of the, sta the stain, that's going to be the tail. This stain up here closest to the scale sticker has an upward directionality and it's upward from left to right. And we can tell that by the tail that's at the upper corner of the stain. When we have um, these types of photographs and, and blood stain patterns existing in a scene where there's different directionalities, what does that tell you as, a, as a, an expert in blood stain pattern analysis? That tells me that there's probably more than one event that's happening to produce these uh, stains. Um, are there, was there, was there um, evidence in this particular scene that there had been efforts to clean up the blood staining that was on the walls and baseboard? Yes. Can you um, point us to some photographs in those photos that are in front of you that will help us understand what you mean by that? Um, 586. Okay, so we're going to put 586 on the board behind you. Okay, so just for orientation purposes, this is the um, power outlet that's lower, um, closer to the floor on that east wall in Gannon's bedroom. Correct. All right, so what are we looking at here? that shows you there's some indication that cleaning had occurred in this bedroom? So there's actually two things um, within this photograph. The first, we can see a visible blood stain right here um, in the center. The edges of this um, stain are very blurred, meaning it's not well-defined. It's been altered in some way. Um, so it's probably be, been cleaned. At the same time, we have this line here, kind of in between the socket and the uh, sticker scale, that is a diluted blood stain. If you think of when you're moving your furniture after you've been walking around for a while and all of a sudden you realize how dirty your carpet is because you're looking at the nice clean carpet versus the dirty carpet, same theory. We have the section of wall that was covered by the plate um, that is clean and the line that defines that diluted blood stain um, right next to it. 
Um, is there also some um, potential blood staining sort of on that outlet in the, the screw area that would hold the plate on um, there in that picture as well? There is. Does that also potentially lead to a conclusion that cleaning had occurred? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> the, um, where were, well, first of all, we can see texture of the wall here, correct? Yes. Is the walls, uh, both the south and the east wall, similarly textured as what we see in, in people's 586? Yes. Were the majority of the blood spots or stains um, in the recesses of that wall texture? That's hard to say. There actually was a fair amount of stains that were on the top of the surface, but there were some that were caught within the crevices. Okay. <laughs> Some point, did you go back out to this particular scene with a person by the name of Tom Griffin? I did. What was that for? Uh, Mr. Griffin won, uh, was doing a bloodstain pattern an analysis on this case and wanted to examine the bloodstains further. Um, so I went out to assist with his examination and any further documentation that he required. Do you know whether or not he actually um, prepared and uh, and? submitted a, an expert report in this case? I do. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may I approach with People's Exhibit 679? You may. Show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 679. I'm going to rely on your intuition here. Um, can you tell what People's Exhibit 679 is? Yes. How can you tell that? Uh, based upon the barcode label that I prepared and attached to this packaging. Is this an item that you actually um, seized or, or um, collected while you were out there on February 5th, I think it was? No, this is not. I'm sorry, what date was it that you collected that item? I collected this on February 13th. February 13th, thank you. Um, is this a sheet that was collected? It is. A sheet from where? Uh, this was a bed sheet that was collected from the bedroom closet in the southeast basement bedroom. Is this the same bedroom that we've been talking about? Yes. Um, why did you collect that sheet? Um, we were given an indication that there was shark print bed sheets um, that we were missing the set. And so it was something that was important. And so we found the bed sheet within the uh, laundry basket and collected it. Subsequent to the time that you collected this item, has it, that uh, bag or evidence collection bag been opened by somebody else? Yes. How do you know that? Um, based upon the additional evidence seals, I can see that it's been opened a couple of times. Okay. Um, to know that the item that's inside that bag is the same item that you collected back on that date in February, would you need to open that bag? Yes. Okay. Um, there are some plastic gloves to your right, and there should be scissors there as well. It is. Going to... My own gloves, because those are going to be extremely large. Is that the bed sheet that you collected on that date? Yes. Um, is it in the same or substantially the same condition today as the day that you collected it? It is. And at this time, I'd move for admission of People's Exhibit 679. Defense. No objection. Exhibit 679 will be admitted. Go ahead. And so 
Um, was the purpose of collecting this item just to compare it to potentially other bedding that may be found at a later date, or what was the purpose? Um, that would be a question better asked for the detectives. Okay. Um, I collected it for anything that needed to be done in the future. <laughs> okay, so a detective just says, hey, get that, and you do it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can I have just a moment, Your Honor? You may. Um, one final thing. Uh, did you find any shell casings in that bedroom? No. Did you find any knife or sharp objects that could have been used to stab somebody? No. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thanks for examination, Mr. Cook. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I think we've met before several times in the last few months, so uh, good to see you again. I just have a couple questions for you. So your testimony to Mr. Allen was that from the staining, the blood pattern, that you think that this was a very violent event? Yes. Okay. And actually that it was multiple events? Correct. What do you mean by multiple events? I think I know what you mean, but maybe the jury doesn't. What do you mean by that? Um, multiple events could be multiple blunt force impacts. It could mean, in this case, uh, different mechanisms. Uh, the blood stains that we saw were indicative of everything from a gunshot wound to blunt force and sharp force injuries. Multiple events could have been a shooting and multiple stab wounds could. with a knife. Okay. And uh, also, in addition to being very violent, multiple events that the blood was coming from different directions. Correct. Right. Just all coming from one way. It was, yes. You said you had some the head and the tail facing one way, the head and the tail facing another way with another stain. So it was coming from everywhere? Uh, from different directions, yes. Okay. Thank you. Redirect. <clears throat> I don't think I have anything on. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Ms. Berrysford? All right. Looks like we have one. Uh, if you would retrieve that, Mr. Allen, and counsel approach, please. Uh, Ms. Berriesford, um, we're not sure if this is the uh, a question that is right for you or for a different witness, uh, so I'm going to ask it. Does anything about the blood stain patterns at the crime scene suggest a chronological order of events? So because a lot of information was uh, cleaned away, we really couldn't or I couldn't tell a chronological order for for any of it all right i will allow reasonable follow-up as to that question only prosecution only um just that um the blood stain patterns that you were seeing were consistent with all those different mechanisms either a gunshot a knife or sharp force or blunt force correct or combination of any of those three correct okay thank you thank you Ms. barry Hood, uh you may step down thank you ma'am thank you
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our uh, noon recess. Again, don't discuss case among yourselves. Don't discuss case with anyone else. Don't do your own independent research about any aspect of this case. Um, if we can have everyone back in the jury room a little bit before 1.30, we should be able to start right on time at that point. Um, with that, all rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Is there anything we need to take up at this point in time, prosecution? Um, the only thing, Judge, is that I'm going to, with the, our next witness, is going to be that next bloodstain pattern analysis okay. expert. So I'm going to be referencing the same photos again, if I can just Fine. leave those up there. Yeah. Um, and that's all I think I have. And the, um, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to ask with respect to the, uh, to the bed sheet, do we have any issues with respect to um, the other issues we have with other evidence? In the no, case? no. Okay. No. All right. Anything from defense? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Court will be in recess. Thank you. All right.
All right, uh, court will call 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stauk. Record should reflect the jury is not present in the courtroom. Is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Prosecution? No, Your Honor. Defense? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and bring them in. <clears throat> Okay. All rise for the jury, please. <laughs> Thank you. You may all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before we call our next witness, I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about a change that um, I need to make um, in the back hallway. Um, when we started this case, we started around um, spring break. So there was not all that much activity in the courthouse. I know that because sometimes I would get here. Mine was the only car in the garage. Um, but uh, now that people are coming back, it's really, really common uh, for lots of trials to get stacked up right after spring break. I am one of six district court divisions on this floor. Right now, everyone on this floor is in trial in one manner or another. Everyone on this floor also has a docket during one week of the day or one day of the week as well. Um, so that creates a huge amount of traffic in the back hallway. Um, typically, when we have a jury trial, we're only using one jury room. I knew that I was going to have um, more than just the 12 presumptive jurors. I also uh, knew that this case was going to take longer than one or two weeks. So when we do that, we use two rooms. So, so number one, we're not packing in like sardines in the jury room and you have some ability to have some comfort. But with that comes some restrictions and we need to start implementing those because it, it's causing problems for other division staff. Um, there's a, yeah, I'm sure you've seen the uh, door to the holding cell that's right behind your uh, jury box. And deputies will use that for other divisions uh, because you'll see, uh, you may uh, you shouldn't see any uh, inmates being transported up and down the hallway um, because we're trying to keep that hallway clear. But the, somebody you might see in an orange jumpsuit, that's what that's all about. Um, and that will happen oftentimes in a criminal docket when somebody's being held in custody. You'll see somebody in an orange jumpsuit uh, going back and forth. You'll also see lawyers back there. You'll see deputies going back and forth. Every once in a while, um, you will hear um, a, a commotion out in the hallway. Every once in a while, you will hear somebody running by like a herd of buffalo. Um, so we need to keep that back hallway clear. So a couple of things that I want you to do, you're still free to go uh, between the two rooms, okay? 
but knock before you open the door and you have to use the restrooms that are associated with the jury room. I don't want anybody going down the hallway anymore. Um, I know that there are two restrooms down there and I, I know that this puts a burden on you because you sort of have to wait. I get that. And I understand if we need to take longer during a break, we'll do that. Um, but right now there is just a huge amount of people in the back hallway. So uh, for your safety, for everybody else's safety, to make sure that there's no confusion as to who's supposed to be where, when, and all of that stuff, please stay in one room or the other and knock before you open the door. Uh, Mr. Combs will let you know whether you can come out um, or not, and we'll leave it at that. So with that, um, Mr. Allen, call your next witness. Thank you. We'll call Tom Griffin. All right. Hopefully he's not wandering around in the hall. Mr. Griffin, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. <clears throat> do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step. As, you got to go around the other way. <laughs> That's okay. Watch your step as you step into the stand. Thank you. All right. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Griffin. Will you please introduce yourself to our jury and then spell your name for the record? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N. Mr. Griffin, um, what do you do for work? I'm a private forensic consultant in bloodstain pattern analysis, crime scene investigation, and reconstruction. What kind of experience do you have in crime scene investigation um, reconstruction, and bloodstain pattern analysis? I spent uh, four years as a crime scene investigator and forensic chemist with the Greeley Colorado Police Department. I left there and then spent 29 years at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation Denver office, where I did forensic chemistry, but also uh, headed a crime scene unit and did bloodstain pattern analysis, both on scenes and on evidential material that was submitted to the laboratory. What kind of um, educational background do you have? I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry and then four years of graduate work in chemistry. I left that to go into the field of forensics where I've taken numerous courses, uh, particularly in bloodstain pattern analysis, six courses. Um, over uh, the years of my uh, time in the field. <clears throat> Who are you um, currently employed by? I'm a private consultant, so I have my own company. I formed after I left the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and I'm also a partner in a forensic consulting and training company out of Oklahoma City, uh, Bevel Gardner and Associates. Do you have ongoing training that you participate in to make sure you stay sharp and abreast of any changes in the field? I do. I attend conferences uh, in bloodstain pattern analysis primarily. Uh, one is the International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysts meets yearly across the country. Uh, also, the International Association for Identification, it meets yearly as well. And I attend workshops there as well as have taught since uh, 2001, approximately 80 workshops in bloodstain pattern analysis for those two forensic associations. Do you have certifications in blood pattern, bloodstain pattern analysis? I do. The International Association for Identification began a bloodstain pattern certification program in 1999. Uh, I have maintained my certification in that and also served for 14 years on their certification board. What about professional affiliations? Do you have any affiliations that go along or hand in hand with your bloodstain pattern analysis? I do. Uh, a current member of the International Association for Bloodstain Pattern Analysts or of Bloodstain Pattern Analysis. I uh, became a distinguished member there in 2011, and I'm also a lifetime member 
meaning I've been in the organization more than 25 years for the International Association uh, for Identification, where I became a distinguished member there in 2016 and have also been involved in a Colorado-based group, the Rocky Mountain Association of Bloodstained Pen Analysts, since its finding or forming in 1983. Have you received awards um, in this field? Yes, I have. Go ahead and tell the jury. The International Association for Bloodstained Pattern Analysis Distinguished Member was voted upon by the membership. It's um, not earned in that sense by applying for it. It's awarded by the membership. And I've also, um, for my distinguished membership in the International Association for Identification, I had to uh, show evidence of participation in workshops, publication of articles in literature, uh, and training as well. So you alluded to my next question, which is, um, have you produced publications regarding bloodstain pattern analysis and crime scene reconstruction? I have primarily two, uh, both in bloodstain pattern analysis. When were those publications done? Um, the primary one was, I believe, in 2000, no, 2010, excuse me, um, an article I co-authored on the foundations of bloodstain pattern analysis for the Journal of Forensic Identification, and then... In the mid-1980s, I co-authored an article in the International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysts newsletter. Okay. <clears throat> um, have you testified as an expert witness in bloodstain pattern analysis and crime scene rec reconstruction? Yes, sir. How many times? Um, just over 50 times now in that field. What jurisdictions? Mostly Colorado, uh, five other states since I went as a private consultant, and a few times in federal court in Denver. Um, who, I guess when I say who, I mean uh, what agencies or parties have retained you to work in bloodstain pattern analysis during your career? When I was with uh, the Greeley Police Department, it was cases that came in to that agency when I was with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, there were cases that came in, submitted from law enforcement agencies, as well as call outs to scenes at the request of law enforcement agencies. Since that time as a private consultant, I have um, responded to requests and worked for um, district attorneys, private attorneys, defense attorneys, and some law enforcement agencies. Who pays you for that type of work? It would be the uh, agency that hires me. So have you been hired by both um, prosecution efforts and defense experts? Yes, sir. Okay. And I said experts. I meant uh, defense parties is what I really meant to say. Yes. Uh, at this time, Your Honor, I move for qualification of Mr. Griffin as an expert witness in bloodstain pattern analysis and crime scene reconstruction. Defense? No objection. The witness will be so qualified. Go ahead. Mr. Griffin, what I'd like to do first, just so that we're all talking the same language, is go over some terminology. Um, so what do you mean when you say the words crime scene reconstruction? Crime scene reconstruction is a specialized field that looks at physical evidence uh, that may include bloodstains, include other forensic fields such as DNA, firearms, shooting reconstruction, uh, medical reports, autopsy reports. And by studying that information, uh, the reconstruction's aim is to determine a best sequence of events uh, and support uh, events happening or not happening and um, 
in response often to particular questions put out by attorneys and investigators. When, when you're testifying in these types of scenarios and you're asked to do work in a particular type of case, <clears throat> are the parties paying for the type of opinion you render in a particular investigation? Uh, no, sir. I only charge um, for my time, not my opinion in any way okay when we talk about bloodstain pattern analysis tell the jury what we mean with when we use those words bloodstain pattern analysis is the examination of blood stains blood stain patterns their size shape distribution location scene context and using physical characteristics of those stains and patterns, identify the nature of the pattern, and then possible events that may have produced any given pattern. What is a spatterns, spatter stain? When I use the term spatter stain, I'm referring to any small blood stain, generally circular to elliptical, um, that was formed as a result, excuse me, as a result of some motion putting blood into flight. What about a non spatter stain? What is that? Non spatter stain is a larger category that includes um, stains. Um, not containing only circles and ellipses, but smeared blood, pools of blood, um, absorbed blood, um, any blood or blood stain pattern that has something besides just circles and elliptical blood stains in it. Can you tell a jury about any limitations of blood stain pattern analysis? It's only as good as the documentation to start with. And its goal is looking at sequence and possible events or mechanisms. It won't tell us whose blood it is, for example. Generally, won't tell us how long blood has been on a surface. Um, and the other limitations are what is available on scene, if it's a scene that we go to to do the analysis, or what's the nature of the photographs and diagrams that we've uh, had supplied to us, as well as other evidence that may be available for viewing. As far as data that you're using to make your analysis and ultimately reach a conclusion, is best practices to have digital um, photographs taken and also a scene visit? When possible, yes. <clears throat> is it typical for you to, um, while you're working on a particular case, to even review autopsy reports? Most definitely. Um, I make it a requirement before I'll issue a bloodstain report asking for copies of autopsy reports since the nature of wounds particularly bloodletting wounds, um, is a key component in um, looking at what possible events may produce stains and patterns. What if there's no body? Can you still do your bloodstain pattern analysis without having access to a body and the evidence it might have, as well as an autopsy report? I can and have. It's limited uh, or produces the limitation not having wound information available. When we're talking about limitations, again, on how effective your work can be in bloodstain pattern analysis, um, what if a scene has been wiped down or cleaned in some way? Can that cause limitations in what you can decipher from the clues you see on scene? Yes. In what way? <clears throat> Anything that removes blood stains or alters their appearance um, affects the physical characteristics of those blood stains 
and limits, perhaps even identifying patterns that are present, and then further limits um, concluding what type of events may have produced a given pattern or series of stains. Okay. How did you become involved in the investigation of Gannon Stouck's disappearance? On February 18th of 2020, uh, Lieutenant McHollow. Mahalko? Thank you. Yep. Uh, called me telling me about the case and asking if I would be available to look at some pictures and possibly help them with uh, a case. Do you remember specifically what question you were asked to look into as it relates to that call on February 18th? Um, primarily, um, if examination of photos and eventually the scene um, would help um, identify possible events or mechanisms that may have been responsible for producing blood stains on the scene. So essentially what may have caused these blood stains to be present in this particular bedroom? Yes, sir. What information did you have at that point uh, regarding relevant factors that you may have to consider as you start your analysis? Um, at that point, um, the information was minimal. Uh, I was told that there was um, no um, body. Gannon's body was not available, um, no apparent weapons. And um, on February 22nd, I received a flash drive that had over 350 digital images of various aspects of the residents and uh, began looking at those bloodstained pictures. Did you look at all of those images that you got on that flash drive? I did. <clears throat> did that lead you um, to any sort of, at least at that stage, any sort of preliminary conclusions as to what you, the scope and what you are dealing with? Um, very preliminary in that the stains I was seeing in the photographs were very small. So I was primarily seeing spatter stains. And um, at that point, couldn't say anything more without additional examination or information. Okay. <clears throat> Did you, in fact, actually um, end up going out to that particular scene? Yes, I did on February 26th of 2020. Tell the jury what you did on the scene that particular day, and then I'll ask you some follow-up questions about that. I arrived on scene uh, accompanied by FBI Special Agent de France, uh, whom I had met and carpooled with from Denver, and we arrived at the residence approximately 1010 that day. Uh, met with uh, CSI Beresford and then Sergeant Hubble, and we all entered the residence at uh, 1015, and Sergeant Hubble walked us through preliminarily, uh, or showing preliminary aspects of the residence for us, and then my attention was focused in the bedroom that I was told was Gannon's bedroom. In your review prior to getting on scene, did you have uh, a chance to look through Alyssa Berriesford's photographs that she took of the scene that included evidence markers that were stuck to the wall in different areas inside that scene? I did have some, yes, sir. Okay. And just so you're aware, there's a binder on the table in front of you, and we're going to be referencing some of those photos. So already admitted in that binder is People's 528, through 678, and I just wanted to orient you to that as well. And when we get to that point, I'll ask you to flip through that and find us some pictures, okay? Okay. Um, with that pre-existing information in mind, so you've looked at pictures, including Barry's uh, evidence photos with the markers on them. Um, 
what are you thinking as you go through the scene on February 26th? What's going through your mind? Primarily to make sure I stay objective in my approach and scientific. So I looked at the stains there on um, primarily south and east walls of the bedroom along the baseboards too. Um, compared what I was seeing in person uh, with images uh, supplied by uh, CSI Beresford. Um, I didn't do any type of magnification of the images. Um, the images on the wall, excuse me, not the images, the stains on the wall were all a millimeter or less in size. And for reference, since the U.S. doesn't do metric very well, the edge of a U.S. dime is approximately a millimeter thick. So the stains I was looking at were as narrow or narrower than the edge of a dime and knew that I would have the photos that I could enlarge for subsequent examination if that became necessary. Yep. <clears throat> Were you aware um, that prior to you getting on scene that there was a bed in that southeast corner of that particular bedroom, Gannon's bedroom? Yes, sir. Had you seen pictures of that, including a picture of Gannon lying in that bed um, prior to you going out to the scene? Um, pictures of the bed uh, on scene, yes, I believe so, but of Gannon, no. Uh, I didn't see that picture until I was there on uh, February 26th. Okay, so you saw the picture of Gannon in bed on February 26th? Yes, sir. Okay. So did that help you as you're looking at this scene and, and doing your analysis to know, I guess, height of that bed and that sort of thing? Primarily just the general position or location in the room of the bed. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, were there blood stains on the walls that were both above and below the height of that bed? Uh, yes, sir, there were. Was that, to some degree, um, helpful for you in analysis, doing your analysis of this case? Um, yes, there were 54 labels um, that CSI Beresford had put on the north, or excuse me, the south and east walls, um, each with a scale and a number. Um, and in looking at all of those um, and comparing to the photos that I had, um, could see that there were between two and three dozen stains that were below stains on the walls that were below um, the reported height of the bed. Do you remember um, by uh, placard number or sticker number, specifically which items were below the height of the bed? I don't remember. I'd need to refer to my report on that, sir. Okay, perfect. Um, if you refer to your report, would that refresh your memory on that point? It would. Or may he refresh his memory using his report? May, go ahead. Your Honor, may I read the label numbers from my report? Just the label numbers? So yes. the attorneys know what you're referring to, that's okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, on the east wall, A1, A2, stains A9 through A21, A24 through A27, a30 and B5. And um, on the other wall, the stains are A34, A35, 
36 through A44 and A46. Okay. <clears throat> and what I want to do is just so that we can have the jury following along with us is using that binder, can you find the exhibit that you think would be best to give us an overall view of those walls and then have you point some of those things out for us? And it's probably going to be more towards the top of that stack as opposed to deep in there because it starts out wide and then gets more narrowed. The ones I'm finding for the first wall, uh, People's Exhibit 558 and People's Exhibit 563. Okay. So we're going to project um, People's Exhibit 558, which was previously admitted under Crime Scene Investigator Alyssa Berriesford on the screen behind you. I'm going to leave it to your preference, whether it's easier for you to describe by looking at the photo in front of you and just talking about it. Or if you want to stand up and point to things on the screen, you can do that as well. There should be a pointer in the witness stand. And so actually, um, let's go to 540 first to get a better overall view so we can then dr dr drill into where we are here. Okay, so we've got 540 on the screen behind you, which is an overview photo of that bedroom, correct? Yes, sir. When we look at 558, point out which wall we're going to be looking at um, in 558. Nope, I need this picture up. Here we go. Um. People's Exhibit 558 is primarily going from the upper right-hand corner down the wall and extending over to just at the electrical outlet. I'm going to compliment you. You've got longer arms than most of the witnesses I've been here during this trial. You can feel free if it's easier instead of stretching to stand up and point. Okay. Your, your preference. Um, okay, so now let's jump into 558. <clears throat> okay, so describe what we're looking at um, for the jury as far as generally stains that are above the bed and stains that are below the bed based on what you just gave us. I may refer to my list again. So it, let me ask you this question. Um, what you're asking to refer to, is that your report that you generated based on your analysis in this case? Yes, sir. Is it an expert report? Yes, sir. Um, what things do you rely upon to create your expert report? Um, information that I receive, photographs I receive, documents such as autopsy reports, lab reports, 
Um, when I do an on-scene analysis, I have that information I bring into play. And I then um, examine, analyze the blood stains, look to characterize them, and ultimately uh, issue a written report of my findings. Okay. And as an expert um, in this field, is it common for you to rely on all of those things and your expert report as you're talking about uh, what you find and your ultimate conclusions? Yes, sir, particularly if I'm dealing with particular stains or groups of stains. Is the information that um, you relied upon in this case, including all of these stickers that are all over the walls in Gannon's room signifying blood spatter, uh, is that a fairly voluminous amount of information? Yes, we're talking 54 stains on two walls. And how many pictures would you guess were, were used by you to make an examination of these walls? Fifty-four pictures, one of each labeled area on the bedroom walls, and then additional photographs of um, blood stains on baseboard, uh, the bottom of the walls, and then um, area of the flooring in that same southeast corner of the bedroom. Each one of those, uh, I'm going to use words that you might not agree with. So if I use words that I don't, that you don't agree with, make sure you tell me. Okay. Those stickers that are on the walls that look like little rulers. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Do each one of those stickers have individual uh, numbering sequence to identify separate and distinct blood stain patterns or blood stains, I should say. I mean, Not the arrows, no, but rather the scales adjacent to some of the arrows. It's these individual metric scales that have um, identifiers for labeling each of those um, adhesive strips. So when you say there's 54 stains, does that mean there's 54 stickers, one sticker essentially for each one of those stains? Yes, there are 54 stickers, most of them by a single stain, but there are some that were by more than one stain. And then uh, you mentioned the arrow stickers. What are the arrow stickers for? I would have to ask the person taking the photo of that. Okay. So there's 54 stickers for the blood stains on there and then a number of arrows on the wall that Alyssa Berriesford or somebody else might have put there. Yes, sir. Uh, the pictures that we're looking at, um, especially as you look at Alyssa Berryford's photos, um, do they start out wide like this and then start to drill down in closer um, focus to finally you get a very up close um, view of a specific stain and sticker? Yes, sir. So would you say there are hundreds of pictures of this particular crime scene to get that detail starting out wide and then coming in focus? At least 100, if not more, yes. Okay. And so when you ask about um, can you refer to your expert report, um, is it common for you to rely on that to make sure that what you're testifying to is accurate and making sure the jury understands what you're saying? Uh, yes, sir. If I'm getting into detailed information about locations of stains relative to some object or questions about any particular stain. And so, Your Honor, based on that, I would ask that he have freedom to just reference his report, just as long as he ref tells us that he's referencing his report. That's fine. So <clears throat> when I was asking you before we went on, on that slight tangent, uh, can you point to us on the wall, this being that eastern wall in Gannon's bedroom, uh, generally, which stains are below the bed level in Gannon's room on this eastern wall? Uh, 
I'll need to compare the photos since reading the labels, um, stain numbers aren't very visible. That's fine. Just make sure you tell us which exhibit you're looking at so that I can put that particular photo up and our record is clear. Using People's Exhibit 558. We're talking, I'm using the pointer here, a few inches above the electrical outlet. The stains that are at or below the height of the bed extend from couple of inches above the electrical outlet down. What does that tell you when you're looking at a scene like this, that there's stains both, both above and below a bed that should have been in place in that corner? That in order to create spatter stains, the blood source has to be, at least for some of the spatter stains, below where the top of the bed would be. Okay. Can you tell the jury um, what we mean when we use the phrase nonlinear spatter? Looking at physical characteristics um, as a scientific approach to blood stain pattern analysis, after determining um, if there are just spatter stains present, I then look for one of two physical characteristics. The first is, do any of the stains have a linear or curvilinear relationship? And if I find stains exhibiting that, I then examine them more closely looking at their shapes in particular. If there is no linearity apparent, the next criteria I use is looking at the presence or absence of a radiating distribution, meaning do the blood stains originate low at a point and then spread out similar to what would happen with um, the axle of a wheel and the spokes of a bike coming out, or the analogy that seems to work best with classes that I teach is to imagine a triangular slice of pizza and the blood source is down at the tip and the radiating pattern is going out along the rest of the pizza slice towards the crust and the edge. And if neither of those criteria are present, then I stop and call the classification as non-linear bloodstains. How did you classify these bloodstains? They were non-linear. What does that tell you as a bloodstain pattern analysis expert? That... Um, eliminates the presence of or the identification of patterns based on the size, shape, and distribution of those stains, um, keeping in mind 
um, any possibility for some type of removal or stains falling off and things like that? When you were out at the scene and potentially even as you're looking at photos of this particular scene, these walls and the floor and whatnot, baseboards, uh, could you tell whether there had been any cleanup efforts undertaken by someone prior to you being involved in this investigation? Yes, sir. Tell the jury about that, please. I noticed primarily along the baseboard baseboards, um, the appearance of diluted blood, um, some of it flowing along a horizontal surface or edge of a baseboard, that suggests a possibility of some type of diluting action on the blood stains, example of which would be some type of cleanup or removal. I'm going to have you pull up a particular photo here. Let me pull it up here in my list. If you flip in that binder that's in front of you to 647 and, for, and, and then beyond that, those should be pictures of the baseboard that were admitted under CSI Alyssa Berriesford. Are you at that point? I am, sir. And so what I would like you to do is, is identify a good picture that we can project up there and you can describe what you're talking about with the cleanup efforts, uh, the signs of a cleanup effort, I should say. I'm sure there's nothing more fun than flipping through a binder with about 50 sets of eyes on you. <laughs> a good example would be people's exhibit 659. Okay, we're going to put that, peep, that photograph up on the screen behind you. I think you have to turn the lid on that thing, otherwise it, or maybe not. When you open it, because it comes out fast. Thank you, Ron. While testifying, we like to give you dexterity tests as well. I'll take all the hints. <laughs> so, Mr. Griffin, we've got... Um, 659 on the screen behind you. So please stand up and use that pointer and point out what we're talking about uh, with the signs that you see in this particular photo that signify a cleanup effort had been undertaken. Looking at two aspects primarily, the first is along the top of the baseboard, which I'm using the pointer to show as far as for the record. And then down on the vertical surface of the baseboard, just above the easel, <clears throat> where there appears to be, again, diluted blood across the surface of the baseboard at that part. Are all the jurors able to see with that easel and where? Do we need to move it for anybody? Everybody's good? Okay. So um, what about those particular blood stains tell you that there's some cleanup. They appear to be diluted from the dark reddish brown color normally I find for blood on scenes. The other pictures of the baseboard, are they similar to this where they have that um, potential flow and even potentially some white marks, wiped marks? Um, there are a couple, yes. Okay. This is probably the best one. Okay. And all these photos will be available for the jury to look at at some point um, when they get to a deliberation stage. 
were any of the um, blood stains on the walls um, drip stains? Uh, no, if I may explain drip stains. So I was going to ask you to explain drip stains. One of the forces acting on blood drops is gravity. And like blood, water, any other liquid, um, when a drop is formed, unless there's something other than gravity acting on it, the drop falls straight down. Drip stains um, are just that, blood stains that are a result of primarily gravity acting on a blood source. So individual blood stains, usually circular on horizontal objects, are shown. You can have drip stains on walls. Um, however, those are characteristic by being long and thin. And there were no such stains um, on either of these walls. Are you familiar with the phrase uh, distribution cone or cone of distribution? Yes, sir. Tell the jury what we mean when we use those words. I testified earlier about looking at characteristic of radiating blood stains. We start our examination in two dimensions. And a fan-shaped distribution of stains is a radiating distribution back to the pizza slice. Actually, blood travels in three dimensions. So blood that's coming out of some blood source, um, and a blood source is kept generic because it can be many types of um, objects not just people, um, the blood will come out in a cone and that cone increasing um, top to bottom, left to right, as the cone goes, the blood goes forward in that cone, very similar to a megaphone in appearance. And we refer to that three-dimensional distribution as a dispersion cone. Can there be voids in a dispersion cone? Among other places, yes, sir. What, what is a void? A void is an absence of blood in an otherwise continuous blood stain pattern which is a little subjective in determining the presence of a void, since an absence of blood may do simply to the fact there was no blood um, put on that given area. Um, what we look for to strengthen the presence of voids is a obvious break in a pattern. Uh, Best example would be um, thinking of it as a shadow effect, where there's a circular object on the wall, a dispersion cone impacts that wall, and that dispersion cone's primarily going to be of blood drops that create spatter stains. If that circular object clock or plate is removed, it has blocked blood from going onto the wall. So the spatter stains will stay on the object and leave a clear, unstained, or void area on the wall. Did you have void areas or potential void areas in this particular scene as well? Um, yes, sir. There was one area I looked at as a potential void. Which area was that? Um, that was on the wall near um, the window. Okay. And so um, if we go back to that overall photograph that shows the, the scene from a wide angle, which I think is 558. 
Yes. Yeah. Hmm? 540 is the number. Thank you. So we're looking now on f at 540 displayed on the screen behind you and on the screen to my left. Um, which wall are you talking about has a potential void? The wall, the wall on the right half of the screen. I think that's the south wall. Should be the south wall. And we have a distribution of stains in the southeast corner that has aspects of a dispersion cone, but not enough that I felt comfortable saying it was a dispersion cone. It's a distribution of stains that decrease as we go up from the floor along the wall. And just above the letter B is in boy on this baseboard, very near the vertical scale that runs along the window that I'm pointing out with the pointer, there is an open area between, I believe it was labeled B40 and B46, um, that shows an absence of blood. You mentioned that <clears throat> when we first started talking about voids, that it could be that just no blood went to that area. Yes, sir. Uh, could a person standing between a victim that's expelling blood um, pre prevent blood from getting onto that area as well? That's one option, yes, sir. What other options are there? Some other object that might be present there. Um, and one of the supports for, again, presenting a void, um, going back to the example I presented of the clock or circular plate on a wall, that object, if it, are, um, it would have blood stains on it, that the blood landed on that intervening object and not the wall. So I would be looking for spatter stains on any object that may have been an, what we call an intermediate target. So that can be a person or an inanimate object. Okay. The, um, we've, we've talked already that there was a bed in place there. Uh, was there also an absence of blood on the bed frame? Yes, per Sergeant Hubble there was. Okay. Is that something you would rely on to make your analysis of this particular scene? Um, yes, sir. That, and as well as during my examination on scene, um, I looked at the ceiling in the southeast corner. I did my own examination of the um, south and east walls with the idea of second set of eyes never hurts. And then... Um, on the blue table currently shown in uh, People's Exhibit 540, I examined that and did not find any blood stains on that table. The fact that um, there was a bed at some point in that corner, um, can you tell based on your analysis that uh, some bloodletting occurred uh, with the bed in place and then somehow the bed is moved and more bloodletting is happening in that scene? That would be a possibility, yes. When you say that that would be a possibility, what are you basing that on? The presence of um, blood stains on the mattress and the blood stains that are higher up on the wall. Um, though blood can travel several feet, so there could be an event on or near the floor that causes blood stains to be higher on the wall, um, but a bed in place uh, as a horizontal 
surface um, could certainly be a um, item upon which um, the blood source could be um, present at the time of blood leaning events. Is it clear from your analysis of this scene that uh, for there to be blood below the bed level, that the bed had to have been moved at some point to allow blood to spatter onto those walls at a level lower than the bed? Yes, sir. For at least some of the stains, because um, in looking at stain shape, if we have an elliptical stain, the tail of that stain points in the direction of travel of the blood, the blood drop that created that stain. And there were stains along the uh, wall labeled A in People's Exhibit 540, where I noted that the direction of travel for the blood drops were basically um, horizontal or parallel to the floor at that point. Okay. You mentioned earlier um, it's common for you to reference uh, autopsy reports in your uh, analysis and before you finalize your conclusions. Is it also common for you to reference um, lab reports? Most definitely. What would you be gathering from lab reports? First, for blood stain pattern analysis, I would be looking for DNA results. And then also results from DNA analysis on objects, including possible weapons, um, firearms, if they're involved in the case. Um, so several disciplines uh, other than just DNA uh, for items that may have blood stains on them. Were you aware um, that blood stains were swabbed in this room and submitted to the lab based on your analysis and the work you did? Yes, sir. Um, did you learn whose blood was on the on the walls? Um, on the outlet, and, and yes, sir, on the outlet primarily. Okay, and whose blood was it? Um, I'm just asking you whose blood was it? It was Gannon's. Okay. And I think, were you just going to point out the outlet? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead and point that out. It's in basically the center of the screen on People's Exhibit 540. There's an electrical outlet near the southeast corner. The plate of the outlet is missing. But... I saw photographs of the plate and the outlet itself showing a reddish substance. Oh. And then DNA results um, reporting that the blood prof DNA profile matched Gannon's. That, that's fair, Judge, and, and we are going to have that at some point. We're just not there yet. So, uh, Mr. Griffin, um, in your uh, training and experience in this field, um, do you submit swabs from every single blood stain from a scene like this to have that DNA analysis done? I never have. Um swab every stain and I don't know anyone that has because not all the swabs will be analyzed. Okay. Is that because of um, just resources at labs and that sort of thing? With my time at the CBI, yes. Okay. It was primarily a resource and time issue. Um, with the information that you had that the, the outlet cover had Gannon's DNA based on the lab report that you were able to look at. In your expert opinion, does that make it likely that the rest of the blood in there is Gannon's blood as well? I 
I don't know that I would use the word likely, but what word would you use? The, to me, the presence of a blood at that point um, and the stains in the area, I would expect Gannon's blood to be present elsewhere on that wall. Okay. The um, the blood staining that we see indicated indicated in People's Exhibit 540 on that uh, south wall on the right side, east wall on the left side of that corner, and then that pool of blood on the um, center of the floor there, not the center of the floor, but in that corner of that floor there. Um, is that significant to you as to the amount of blood that was expelled during whatever event expelled that blood? Yes, sir. What does that tell you? First of all, looking at the southeast corner on the floor, I was shown photographs of the floor with the carpet and the pad in place carpet and pad cut up and told, if not actually in reports I received, that there was saturated blood in the carpet and the pad in that corner that was identified as the DNA being Gannon's profile. Um, this area measured on the, the floor under the carpet, the stained area measured approximately 20 inches by 20 inches. So looking at the context of the scene, as we call it, we have a blood source on or near the floor in this corner as blood is coming out of that blood source and then spatter stains on the wall all in the southeast corner of the bedroom um, that are suggestive of some type of spatter producing event, a minimum of one on or near the floor. Okay, so we're going to talk about that if you um, wouldn't mind going back. There you go. Um, did you have a chance to review the autopsy report in this case prior to issuing your final conclusion? Yes, sir. Um, prior to you issuing your final conclusion and reviewing that autopsy report, based on the work that you had already done in the scene, looking at photographs, visiting it, that sort of thing, did you make a preliminary assessment as to what types of uh, events could have caused this type of blood pattern analysis or blood pattern, blood stain pattern? I did, yes, sir. What was that? Ooh. On February 26th, um, between approximately 1.15 when I finished my on-scene examination and after packing up supplies, I met with uh, Sergeant Hubble and Lieutenant Mahalko. 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 Um, and told them I would give them very preliminary result, nothing in writing. Um, it could be subject to change based on additional information. And basically what I told them is given the pooling and the spatter stains on the two walls and the nature of patterns that are there and patterns that are not, I would look at uh, one of or a combination of three possible events. One event would be a shooting in which the wound is a penetrating wound, meaning there is no exit since there were no defects that I observed anywhere in the wall or the floor. So one possible wounding mechanism is gunshot. A second possible mechanism would be some type of event that involved creating blunt force trauma, such as beatings and stompings. 
The third event or mechanism we use them interchangeably uh, would be some type of um, action or energetic activity involving a bladed object. Not necessarily knife, but what I call a bladed object, generically speaking, or a combination of those three. So when you say a bladed object, are you just meaning a sharp object? Sharp object, yes, sir. Okay. You mentioned um, a penetrating gunshot, uh, but you mentioned no defects were found. Did you not find any uh, bullet holes in the walls or impacts on the floor or anything like that? I did not. Um, I did not find any of those. Okay. Once you were able to get the autopsy report, um, what did that do regarding your preliminary opinion as to what types of events or mechanisms could have caused this bloodstain pattern? Um, in reading Gannon's autopsy report, I noted the pathologist reported blunt force trauma to Gannon's head, um, a penetrating gunshot wound, I believe, to the jaw, the face area, and then sharp forced injuries, bladed injuries, bladed object injuries, um, to the rest of his body um, with, I believe, at least half of those being on his hands and his arms. And um, specifically as it relates to that sharp force injury portion, 18 separate sharp force injuries. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> I'm going to have you go to um, flip all the way through to in that binder. We've got three exhibits in a section labeled for just you. And those are exhibits 684, 685, and 686. Pardon me. Yep. Thank you. Are you to that section there? Yes, sir. Okay. So when we're talking about 684, 685, and 686, do you recognize those photographs? I do. How do you recognize them? People's Exhibit 684 and 685 um, are among the 360-plus photographs I was given um, to examine um, as part of my um, examination and analysis for bloodstain patterns. People's Exhibit 684 is um, a generally well-lit photo showing the walls in the southeast corner. Um, the, south, the carpet and pad at the southeast corner no longer present. Um, and People's Exhibit 685 is a very dark photograph with faint blue um, coloration showing in the image. Is, are those sequence of photos, 684, 685, and 686, essentially overlaying 684 and 685 to get to 686? Yes, sir. People's Exhibit 686 is an overlay I uh, created using Photoshop software, which is an overlay is one technique that we use um, when documenting the effect of the use of Blue Star um, on scenes, um, <coughs> balancing the darkness required for the Blue Star and some well-lit um, or, or good lighting to show the overall aspects of the scene. So the um, locations where there is Blue Star reacting um, can be seen better in an overlay. 
did you do this in this particular case um, because of the potential significance of this scene having been cleaned up, meaning Blue Star would react um, to show a greater dispersion than what you're seeing in these blood stain patterns? Um, actually, my reason for doing it was um, simply to see what could be shown with the overlay of the two photos, regardless of any type of blood removal activity. And what did this inform you as to um, your analysis? Um, the blue star showed a positive reaction on both the south and the east walls and um, the southeast corner on the floor um, beneath where the saturated carpet and pad was. Okay. Um, are these fair and accurate photos? Yes, sir. You're going to move for admission of 684, 685, and 686. No objection. 684, 85, and 86 will be admitted. Permission to publish, Mr. Bank, go ahead. Okay, so we've got 684 on the screen there. Is this just basically that same southeast corner of Gannon's bedroom with those same uh, blood stain markers on the walls? Yes, sir. And then if we move on to 685, what is 685? That is the um, photo taken in darkness after the application of the blue star. Does this photo, as we're projecting it on the screen, is it brighter than what's actually printed out in people's 685 in that binder in front of you? Yes, very much so. What does, what does this tell us uh, when we see this sort of, I mean, to me, it looks like a constellation in the night sky or something. What does this tell us? Blue star is a chemical that's used as a searching tool for diluted blood. Um, and it is a presumptive indicator of blood. Um, Blue Star will react with non blood, but it's designed to go uh, react primarily or to react and show the presence of diluted blood. Um, so let me ask you a question um, just to clarify really where I want to go with this. And that is, um, this looks like more than 54 uh, marker potentials. Why are we seeing more in this than we see when we look at the overall normally lit photographs with the markers stuck to the wall? Um, the bright blue color from the blue star um, would indicate areas of possibly diluted blood being present on scene on both the walls and the baseboard and the floor. No way to tell for sure whether that, all of those spots would be blood though, correct? Correct, not without um, sampling and good luck. Okay, um, <clears throat> and if we could go on to 686. Is this the overlay of 684 and 685? Yes, sir. Again, is this um, brighter than what's printed out in people's 686 in the binder in front of you? Yes, sir. Why do we not see, um, I'm looking at the floor with that bigger um, blood stain in the, on the concrete there. Why is that part not blue, even though that's blood? There could be a couple of reasons for it. Um, one is the um, amount of blood might be so minimal that the blue star has no reaction with it. 
um, and therefore um, no reaction as shown in the other areas. Could also be due to um, the spraying of the luminol, excuse me, the blue star, and um, areas that might receive more of the blue star reagent than other areas. Is luminol and blue star essentially the same thing? Yes, sir. Okay. Based on um, what you're seeing in this particular scene, I'm going to make an assumption in the way I'm asking this question. If that's all a result of what happened to Gannon, uh, based on your reviewing this scene and the autopsy report, um, is it likely that Gannon would not be up and walking around after suffering this attack? From blood stain pattern analysis, I can say that with it being Gannon's blood, um, he's on or near the floor for at least one or, in some cases, a minimum of two impact events, spatter-producing events. Um, but I'm not able to opine on his mobility in relation to that. Well, you reviewed the autopsy report, correct? Yes, sir. Um, there's four blunt force trauma injuries to the head, right? Yes, sir. Um, there's also the gunshot to the left chin sl slash jawline. Yes, sir. In that autopsy report, it has um, trajectory of the bullet through the head area of Gannon. Yes, sir. Um, including potentially according to the doctor, that it severed the spinal column? Yes, sir. So can you not make a um, likelihood uh, determination based on that information in conjunction with your scene? I agree. Sustained. Okay. Um, as far as your report, and we can take the photo down. As far as um, your report, uh, we've already talked about um, the contents of it being based on lots of different things, right? Yes, sir. Uh, your training and experience goes into producing this report? Yes. Uh, photographs? Yes, sir. Uh, access to and review of other expert reports like the autopsy report, and a crime lab report, including DNA? Yes, sir. Um, would it be helpful for the jury to have access to your report um, in some point after you're on the stand? Sustained. Your Honor, at this time, I would move for admission of People's Exhibit 682, which is his report, and that would be pursuant to CRE 1006. I'm going to object to the report actually going into evidence. Yeah, I, well, let me see the report. Thank you. Objection is sustained um, on a little bit different grounds. Um, first of all, um, this is an expert report. 
um, to the extent that it requires expertise to understand any of the items that are contained in the report, the jury would not have uh, this expert with them at the time to try and understand what the report meant. Um, so uh, there's not an expert to uh, explain uh, the items in the report that require expertise to the extent that uh, the report uh, contains opinions that have already been offered by the expert the report is cumulative to the experts testimony so um, I will uh, deny admission of uh, exhibit 683 okay thanks Josh and yep I'll retrieve that from you okay. and then that is the conclusion of my questions Good afternoon, how are you? Good afternoon, sir. I'm well, thank you. All right. I want to ask some questions, and if I'm incorrect, just let me know. Um, the, the blood stains, were you able to determine kind of the, the size of those blood stains? For the ones on the wall? The on yes, the wall. sir, they were a millimeter or less in size. And what would that indicate to you? Would that indicate low velocity, medium velocity, or high velocity? Um, we don't use those velocity terms in blood stain. What the size indicates is a spatter producing event. Um, so that blood is broken up by some type of energetic activity. Can you tell based upon the size of the stains? What was the event that caused the spatter? Um, and just for example, my understanding is like a gunshot is going to produce smaller spatter than blunt force trauma. And so based upon the size of the blood stains that were on the wall, can you make a determination or an educated guess on the mechanism? No, sir. Um, you're correct in that generally... Um, Blood um, patterns produced by gunshot wounds create smaller blood drops and therefore smaller stains than you get with blunt force trauma. Um, but based on the size of the stains, I don't feel that I can eliminate an event. Is that because that it had been there? It appears there have been some effort to clean that, or is that because of the way that the Blue Star picks it up? Um, or is there some other type of reason that we're not able to use the size of the blood stains to make a determination of the mechanism? I would say it's a combination of um, the apparent removal of blood stains, such as by um, however you said, washing or cleaning. Okay. And um, the ability of the Blue Star to... Um, um, indicate the presence of diluted blood whose stains may be too small to actually see. Okay. The gunshot wound to like the underside of the chin, what type of blood spatter would you expect that to create? The term that we apply to um, blood associated with gunshot entrance wounds is called the back spatter. It's blood that has blood droplets that have come back towards the direction of force. So I would be looking for primarily blood stains, one, two millimeters in size, maybe less. Okay. Or, I don't think, the gunshot wound, since that was only an entrance wound, would he have had to be in facing the wall for any of the blood spatter to come from the gunshot wound? Not necessarily facing the side of his head could be. Um, position so a dispersion cone partially goes that way towards the wall. And how close would he have had to been to the wall for the gunshot wound to cause the blood spatter? There's no hard um, 
remedying data for that. Um, it's usually looked at as being within four to six feet. Okay. And I, and so do, is the term like low velocity, medium velocity and high velocity, is that no longer used in your field? That's correct. Um, okay. Swig stain worked on those terms and replaced them. When did you do that? A while ago? Um, Swig stain we formed in 2002. So somewhere in the mid 2000s. Okay. But I mean, there still is my understanding is the mechanism will produce different size droplets of blood to spatter. So something that is contacting at very high velocity will make smaller blood stains, something at a medium, you know, blunt force trauma used to be referred to as medium velocity because it's kind of a medium speed of the blood flowing out. And then there was low velocity, you know, that can come from like a knife wound or something like that. Is that so generally a premise? It's still generally um, looking at, the preponderance of stain size, yes, sir. Um, are you able to make a determination based upon the size of any of the blood spatter that was on either one of the walls, whether they were caused by a sharp object like a knife wound or whether they were caused by something that'd be more akin to what we would call medium velocity in the old days of blunt force trauma? I'm not able to. Can you tell how many events took place to cause that blood spatter? A minimum of two based on the dispersion of the blood and the direction blood drops have traveled. So the minimum is the best I can offer. Can you offer a maximum? No, sir. Could it have been many? 10? It, again, I can't put a number to it, sir. Okay. Would any of the events had to have occurred above the bed? Because we talked that some of them had to occur below the bed based upon where the spatter was. Is there any of, anything indicating that any of them would have had to occur above the bed? I think it's possible, yes, sir. Anything that you saw that would indicate more one more than the other? No, sir, not given the potential for cleanup. It, you reviewed the autopsy? Excuse me? You reviewed the autopsy in this case? The report, yes, sir. You're aware there were also two projectiles, bullet projectiles found in the Pella case? When uh, Gannon was recovered? I'm not remembering it independently, sir. Okay. You didn't see anything in that room that would indicate an object that had been struck by a bullet correct i did not and lastly you're not just here out of the goodness of your heart no sir you're getting paid by the district attorney's office yes sir how much are you getting paid um, our company rate is 290 295 an hour and do you know how many hours you put in on this I don't remember the billing hours I did for my on-scene analysis and the report. Um, it's more hours than I billed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir, for the questions. You're direct. So we got a discount? <laughs> you don't tell. <laughs> um, you were asked about different sizes uh, of these, um, the potential for different sizes by Mr. Tolini. You testified previously though that each one of these was one millimeter or less, is that right? Yes, sir. Did the fact that this um, area appeared to have been cleaned up impair your ability to find bigger and smaller size blood stains on this wall? That's possible, yes. Um, you were asked about the number of events and you said minimum of two, but you could not give a maximum? That's correct. Um, in reference to that, you obviously saw the, the autopsy report. Yes, sir. So could it have included enough events to include four blunt force trauma injuries, 18 stab wounds, 
in one gunshot wound? Can it go that high? It's possible factoring in um, that incised wounds such as were reported for Gannon's hands and arms, they can act as blood sources as well to produce spatter stains. Meaning, let me break in there. Do you mean that an arm might be moving and causing blood to, to fly off the arm? Yes, sir. Okay, that's all I have. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Mr. Griffin? No, all right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you. Council approach, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our afternoon recess. If I can have everyone back in the jury room at, say, 325, we should be able to start time at that point. Again, don't discuss the case among yourselves. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. Please remember the instructions that I gave you about uh, leaving the jury room. Um, you don't want to cause uh, Mr. Combs to tear out his hair for obvious reasons, you can see. Um, so with that, uh, we will take our break. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Prosecution? No, Your Excuse me. Is there anything you need me to stop? It's all right.
they don't have days, it's just how many. But we want to write it between them. Right. Court will call 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stauk. Record should reflect the jury's not present in the courtroom. Is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Prosecution? No, Your Honor. Defense? No, sir. Okay, let's go ahead and bring him in. <laughs> Yeah, I wish there was a way to cool it down, but I do just. It's a little hot in here today. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 People versus Letitia Stout. Records could reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. We'd call Detective Pete Woods to the stand. Detective, if you would step forward and raise your right hand. It'll be up there. <laughs> Somebody else already did that, so that's okay. Raise your right hand, sister. Do you swear affirm the testimony back to this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and see the witness stand. You're not the only one that did that either, so. Yep, it's all good. Good afternoon, Detective. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for the record? My name is Peter Andrew Woods. I'm a detective with the Myrtle Beach Police Department. Spelling of my last name is W-O-O-D-S. How long have you been with the Myrtle Beach Police Department? I'm starting on my 16th year with the Myrtle Beach Police Department. Any prior law enforcement experience? Prior to that, I did 20 years with the New York City Police Department. I would have never guessed that in a million years. <laughs> <laughs> so, if my math's correct, 36 years of law enforcement experience? Yes, sir. Um, what are you doing now for the Myrtle Beach Police Department? The last seven years, I've been assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force of the FBI as a Myrtle Beach detective representing the interests of Myrtle Beach Police Department in the world of then domestic terrorism and international terrorism. How about in March of 2020, what were you doing for the Myrtle Beach Police Department? I was still assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We were made aware of a person that was wanted by the, uh, municipal, the El Paso County Sheriff's Office and I took part in, I gave a briefing for the arrest of a person that was wanted. Would that have been on March 2nd of 2020? The briefing, yes, was conducted at 8 a.m. at the Myrtle Beach Police Annex located in the city of Myrtle Beach at 3340 Mustang Street. I briefed the Myrtle Beach Street Crime Unit and the Myrtle Beach SWAT police officers. And who was the person that you were briefing or uh, briefing about, I guess, to arrest? Uh, a woman named Letitia Stouch. And was there a warrant for her arrest out of Colorado, El Paso County, I think? Yes, there was. And so who was involved in this briefing? Myself, I, I conducted the briefing, but it was the, the members of the uh, Lieutenant uh, Jeremiah Beam and, and all of his members of his street crime unit and Sergeant, at the time, Smith, and members of, of his SWAT unit. Were the FBI involved in this briefing? They were, they were also there earlier, and it was uh, Special Agent Grant Lowe was there, and another TFO, uh, Ryan Seip, a task force officer. And what did you brief about, what, and what was the purpose of this briefing? We were made aware of that... Letitia Stouch would be dropping her daughter off at the 
Air Force Recruiting Station. The Air Force Recruiting Station is located in the city of Myrtle Beach at 1100 Coastal, Coastal Way, and that she'd be dropping her, her daughter off there. It was determined for safety reasons that once, in South Carolina law, anyone under the age of 18 is considered a juvenile. So when she was dropped off, we figured it was the best opportunity to take her into Letitia into custody without any one being hurt. You mentioned um, this Letitia Stout's daughter. Do you know what her name was? Uh, Haley Hunt. Was it Harley? Harley, Harley Hunt. Harley Hunt. Yes. Uh, and did you have uh, pictures or photographs of these individuals so you know who you're talking about? We had we had done uh, previous surveillance before leading up to the arrest, so we knew what she looked like and we knew what Letitia looked like. Okay. And do you see this woman named Letitia Stalk in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Could you point her out and describe what she's wearing? She's wearing a white uh, blouse with patterns of like flowers and other other figures on it. Seated to my left here? Yes. Uh, may the record reflect identification. Yeah, the record will so reflect. Go ahead. So how did you get this information that she was going to drop Harley off at a Air Force recruiting station? Special Agent Grant Lowe was, was in contact with El Paso and also with the FBI folks out here in Denver. So they had gotten us that information. And do you know how long... Uh, the defendant and her daughter were under surveillance? For, um, for me, we, we had started uh, watching her since the Thursday before. The arrest was taking place on, on the mon that Monday. So since that Thursday, we, we watched Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So you had a good idea of their activities, and then you later learned on Monday Harley was going to be dropped off. Yes. And so what was the significance, again, of having – uh, the defendant arrested after her daughter was dropped off? The significance was far as safety for all concerned because she was in a house with other people and we, that was a search warrant was done at that house also, but we wanted the least amount of people at the time when we would take her into custody. And did you have surveillance units out there on March 2nd, uh, 2020, following them and watching all these activities take place? Special Agent Grant Lowe followed, followed them into the city and gave updates to all of the other, oh, the Myrtle Beach Street Crime Unit, myself, and all the other people that were set up at the mall waiting for them. And so was there a point in time where it became uh, safe to make this arrest of Letitia Stalk? Yes. When once it was seen that uh, the daughter was in with the recruiter and that Letitia was driving the vehicle from the scene. That was that was that was a, with the the best situation for safety for everyone, and that's when we she was arrested. And describe the arrest for the jury. How did it go down? She is driving away from the recruiting station, and a vehicle from behind and a vehicle from the front turn on the police blue lights and give commands to stop the vehicle. And Sergeant Smith and police officer Cooper approach the vehicle, take her out of the vehicle, place her in handcuffs. She subsequently searched, and that in, uh, the arrest took place less than a, less than a minute. Uh, during this process, were you present? Could you yeah. see this happen? Yes, I could. From where I was also sitting, we were all sitting in different places. I, could, I witnessed the whole, the whole thing. Uh, was the defendant the only one in this vehicle? Yes, she was. And what kind of vehicle was it? It's a minivan. It was dark in color, and it was it it was had uh, property in it. So once she was removed from the vehicle, the vehicle was uh, closed. The keys were taken. It was taken to the Myrtle Beach Police Annex, which is located at thirty three forty Mustang, and it was placed in a secure area for the uh, the FBI crime scene people to process it. And we'll get there in just a sec. I want to talk about the actual stop of Ms. Stauk. Uh, were these other vehicles that you described, one in front and one behind, were they marked police cars? No, they were, they were um, unmarked cars, but they had obvious uh, uh, police lights. They had uh, the, the SWAT officers had uniforms that where you could visibly see police written on the uniforms in the police patch of the Myrtle Beach Police Department. Did the defendant stop? Yes, she did. 
Uh, did she cooperate with the arrest? She complied. She she immediately got out of the vehicle and complied with all their requests. She didn't try to run or didn't try to do anything like she that? She did not. Uh, what were the individuals? Well, where were you at during this um, arrest? Uh, approximately 25 yards away. Did she seem to understand that those were police officers who were stopping her and complying with their orders? Yes, she did. Now, you talked about the van being taken to a secure facility to be searched. Were, were you present when that van was searched? Later that, the, later that night, yes, I was present for when actually people, the um, um, special agent Debbie Gordon of the FBI, when she went to process the, the van, had me walk around the van with her from the outside. She took photographs of it. And I, the van was secure, wasn't unlocked yet. And when she, we did that walkthrough, walk around, mm -hmm. more correct, uh, she noticed the suitcase. And she requested me to obtain a search warrant for the suitcase that was in the van. Your Honor, with that, there is a stipulation to the admission of People's Exhibit 355 through 370. I assume they're photographs. Uh, three items are not photographs. Okay. Um, um, but there is a stipulation of 355 to 370. Correct. All right. Exhibits 355 through 370 will be admitted. Go ahead. We're going to publish with the court's permission People's Exhibit 355. Can I approach and move the ESO yard? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. What do we see in People's Exhibit 355, Detective Woods? That is the van that Letitia was driving that day, and that is the Myrtle Beach Police Annex, where the vehicle was towed to from the scene of Coastal Mall. We can go to 356 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 356? 356 is now we've already obtained the warrant to search the uh, suitcase, and now uh, Special Agent Gordon has opened the doors and has started taking pictures of the property that's in the van. And I want to turn your attention to what appears to be an envelope uh, in the center dash there. Do you see that? Yes. Did you know who that envelope was addressed to? I, when it was taken out, I could see it was addressed to Letitia Starch. Okay, we'll go to 357. Is that the envelope we're talking about? Yes. And is the defendant's name on there? Yes, it is. We can go to 358 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 358? The largest thing is the the uh, su uh, suitcase, which is pink with uh, polka dots, pink and white polka dots. Is that the suitcase you alluded to earlier where you had to get a warrant for? Yes. Uh, we see a placard one in the driver's seat there. Do you know what was in that item? There was a cell phone in that, um, in that area. Okay. We can now go to People's Exhibit 359. What do we see in 359? That was the suitcase that I had Detective Daniel Eddy of the Myrtle Beach Police Department go to the magistrate's office to get a, a, a warrant just to search that. He brought it down to me, and I delivered that to Special Agent Debbie Gordon of the, the crime scene unit of the, Myrtle, of the FBI. And this suitcase, is that the position it was in uh, prior to anyone going into this van? Yes. We go to People's Exhibit 360. What do we see in People's Exhibit 360? The suitcase is now taken out of the van and is, and is being processed by... Agent Gordon. Uh, there's some gloves and some scissors to your right on a table. And to your left, there's a box that is People's Exhibit 361. If you wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask you to put that box open on the red tape on the top of it. And let's see uh, what's inside.
So, so the record's clear. Detective Woods has just pulled a what appears to be a suitcase out of the box. Is that the suitcase that you found in the van back on March 2nd, 2020? Yes, this is it. If you could possibly hold that up and just kind of display it to the jury. I'll move this box out of your way. <laughs> Now, there appears to be some tags on the top of the bag. Do you know uh, what names are on those tags? I'm looking at uh, it. says Letitia Stouch. It says Tisha Stouch and it has a phone number. You want me to put the phone number? No, that's okay. That's, that's all we need. All right. Uh, at this time, I also want to show you People's Exhibit 405, which is an ex exhibit that's already in evidence. You see that suitcase anywhere in this picture? Right here. Here's to be the same suitcase that you recovered from the van. Yes, it is. You can go ahead and resume your seat. Thanks. You can go to People's Exhibit 362 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 362? It's the same suitcases we have here, and there's a blanket, blue blanket. Uh, did you see any blood on the inside of this suitcase? I, I saw what I believe to be blood in, on the blanket, yes. Could you point that area where you believe there to be blood? There's a pointer up there somewhere too, Detective. Red handle on We're old school here in Colorado, so we've got the... I bet you're an expert. <laughs> there's no there's no point I can, I can here you go oh it's on the oh, oh we got it we go. so here 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 and here okay and uh, you said it appeared to be blood but it was was it pretty obvious to you that I most likely would believe it to be blood, yes. Did you guys note that when you opened the suitcase up? I mean, you didn't say it's ketchup or anything like that, right? Um, it's okay. Okay. You can go ahead and resume your seat. We can go to 363. What do we see in People's Exhibit 363? The blanket is laid out. It's laid out processing. We go to 364. Why do we have this picture? More, which appears to be blood on the blanket. And 366. What do we see in People's Exhibit 366? The contents that were underneath the uh, blanket in that same suitcase that's here. People's 367. Is the, the contents being processed? Are you slowly removing items out of the suitcase? I was not. Uh, the uh, the the uh, Debbie Gordon was doing that. I, I was there. I was stayed here till the conclusion of this whole search. Okay. And how about three sixty eight? What do we see in three sixty eight? A black bag. Now this has placard one. Does this relate to the placard one that we saw earlier in the driver's seat? Yes, it was. That was that was in the drive to the driver's seat, right here. And then we can go to 369. What do you see in 369? That is a cell phone that was in that bag. And do you see any names on this uh, screenshot of the cell phone? I see Tisha again, and that is the same spelling as is what's on the suitcase. And then 370 should be there in front of you. It's a physical exhibit. Already in the evidence. But what is 370? This is the that phone that is being shown in that picture. That's the phone that we see in the picture. Yes, it is. Did you uh, or your agency eventually ship these items or have them shipped back to El Paso County College? The phone, the, yes, the phone was taken for processing and everything was sent back to El Paso. And were you aware what Ms. Stout was doing after she was arrested? She was taken also to 3340 Mustang for processing. And 
Were, are you aware of any medical concerns that she was claiming at that time? I'm just asking if he's aware at this time. Yeah, now I'm going to sustain it unless he heard it from the defendant. Did you have any contact with the defendant? Not about medical issues, no. Uh, did you watch any of her interview? Yes, I did. Uh, did you hear her address any medical issues? None. Okay, we won't ask you that question then. Those are my questions, Jar. Thanks. Cross examination. That exhibit up. Sure. Okay. That, that. Which name is the same name as the name on the suitcase? This one says Tisha. Is it Tisha or Tila? I, I have to look closely. I am wrong. It was, that's not Tisha. Okay, it's Tila. Yes. No further questions. I'm sorry, redirect. No, thanks, Sean. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Detective Woods? No. All right. All right. Thank you, Detective. You may step down. Why don't you step? All right. I can just have a second to retrieve the exhibit, Sean. Yes. On the short time. For the record, Your Honor, um, this I have already admitted it's okay, but I just told you. Uh, you need to identify it first. This is going to be. Three sixty five. Right, three sixty five has been admitted. You can publish it. Um, are you going to be having witnesses use this stuff next? No. Set it down on this side so that we can, they can get by. Thank you. You know that box just came this way? The over here, well? Yeah, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. Thank you, uh, John Price. Mr. Price, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. You swear from the testimony about giving this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead and see the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Good afternoon, sir. Will you please introduce yourself to our jury and then spell your name for the record? Detective John, spelled J-O-N, Price, P-R-I-C-E. Mr. Price, um, what do you do for a living? I'm a detective for the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. How long have you worked for the El Paso County Sheriff's Office? 21 years. <clears throat> what sort of roles have you held in law enforcement? I've worked in the jail. I've worked on the road as a patrol deputy, and I've worked as a detective. How long have you been in your current detective role? Um, six years. What sort of assignments have you had as a detective? I've worked in uh, sex crimes, financial crimes, and currently as a homicide detective. Okay. What was your assignment back in January of 2020? I was a homicide detective. Did you get involved in the investigation into the disappearance of Gannon Stout? Yes. How did you get involved in that case? Um, I was assigned to primarily be at the searches of the house and also the vehicles. And later on, that kind of morphed into um, tracking some of the physical evidence as well. How many times did you go out to the house at 6627 Mandan Drive? Uh, I believe it was six, five or six. Okay. <clears throat> Each time you would go out to the house, would you use new information that was uh, gained through the investigation as a reason to go look for potentially more things in the house? Yes. You mentioned that you also um, got into some vehicles as well. Is that right? Yes. What vehicles did you have a chance to search vehicles? Which vehicles? I was a part of the search of the Tiguan and the Jetta. Okay. And 
what information did you have as it relates to the Jetta? Whose vehicle did you understand that to be? Harley's. Harley Hunt? Yes. And then the Tiguan, who did you understand that vehicle to be? The defendant. We're going to hear from other witnesses at some point um, in this trial, but uh, did you search with people from the FBI, the Tiguan? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about the Jetta first. Um, was that search conducted on January 31st, 2020? Yes. I'm going to approach with People's Exhibits 709 and 710. You may. Go ahead. Can you please take a look at People 709 and 710? And let me know when you're done looking at them. Okay. Um, do you recognize those items? Yes. How do you recognize them? Um, they are labeled as being identification documents um, belonging to Harley Hunt and Leticia Stauk, which were collected from the Jetta, and they have my markings on them. So did you actually collect those items from that Jetta on January 31st, 2020? Yes. <clears throat> um, you should have, I don't know if you want to wear gloves for those items or not. Um, we're going to open those up. Um, if you want to wear gloves, go ahead and do that, and there should be some scissors there. And let's start with um, People's 709. So you've got the items out of People 709 now? Yes. Do you recognize those items specifically? Yes. Are they in the same condition today or roughly the same condition today as when you collected them back on January 31st? Yes. You know, at this time, I'd move for admission of People's Exhibit 709. No objection. Exhibit 709 will be admitted. Go ahead. Um, what documents do we have in People 709? And mm -hmm. just explain that to the jury, please. Uh, 709 has Harley Hunt's passport. It has her social security card, has a passport photo, and um, a South Carolina um, school document pertaining okay. to Harley Hunt. Okay. Are you familiar with passports? Yes. Um, are you familiar with um, how sometimes passports will get stamps in them if you visit foreign countries? Yes. Um, can you look through Harley Hunt's passport and tell us if there are any stamps in there for any visits to foreign countries? There is a stamp for Jamaica, December 14th, 2017. And that's the only stamp I see. And that's it. Okay. Go ahead and remove the, or I'm sorry, replace those documents back into the evidence envelope. And then I'm going to get those off your desk there. Well, I'm doing that if you could go ahead and open up you know, 710. So preliminary questions, do you recognize the documents that you've pulled out of the envelope um, that we have marked with an evidence sticker 710? Yes. Um, are they in the same or substantially the same condition today as the day you collected them back on January 31st, 2020? Yes. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I move for admission of People's Exhibit 710. Yes. Objection. Exhibit 710 will be admitted. Go ahead. What items do we have inside of People's Exhibit 710? Uh, 710 has Leticia Stout's. Um, United States passport, has a passport photo, a security public library card with the name Tisha on it, a social security card in the name Letitia L. Harden, 
a social security card in the name of Leticia Harden Stout. Are the just I don't want you to read the social security numbers, but is the social security number the same on both of those documents? Yes. Okay. A um I think this is from a cruise, kind of a spending card from a cruise in the name of Leticia Stout. A marriage certificate between uh, Leticia and um, Albert. A photocopy of the same marriage certificate. Um, This is a, a printout of an email. Which, no, that's okay. Um, photocopies of a South Carolina driver's license and the two social security cards. What are the names on those um, documents of that photocopy? Uh, Leticia Stout and Leticia Harden, respectively. And a photocopy of the passport. What's the name on the passport? Leticia Stout. Are there, um, in any of those documents that we just looked at, any documents with any other names uh, for a first name and then Stauk, any Taylor Stauk or anything like that? No. Okay. And you're opening up a secondary envelope that was contained in the evidence envelope? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, just a general email. A letter from the Federal Bureau of Investigation to Leticia Stout. A North Carolina birth certificate for Leticia Stout. A verification of K-12 educator experience form. What What is the, is there a name on that one? Um, it's difficult to read. Or it's Harry County Schools. Is it Horry County Schools? H -O -R County, yeah. yeah. That does have the name Leticia Stauk on it. Okay. Um, a infant child CPR certificate in the name of Eugene Stauk. Okay. A behavioral health consultation information form. Okay. Um, an appointment. Reminder form for Leticia Stout. Uh, a American Red Cross infant child CPR form for Tisha Stout. A medical report for Leticia Stout and another a second page of that. Okay. Um, go ahead and put those items back in that secondary envelope and then I'll ask you some follow-up questions. Do that later. Okay. <laughs> uh, any documents in there um, that would uh, that were addressed to or belong to a name on them with Maria Sanchez? No. Okay. Uh, getting the accessing the passport that you have there for Leticia Stout. Okay. Again, looking for stamps for visits to foreign countries. Are there any stamps in Leticia Stout's passport for visits to foreign countries? There's a stamp dated October 22nd, 2017. I can't read it. It says Department of Homeland Security US. So okay. I think that's probably a re-entry stamp perhaps. Okay. Uh, a Jamaica stamp, December 14th, 2017. A Mexico stamp, um, July 24th, 2018. And that appears to be all the stamps. So are there any stamps in there from Australia? No. Are there any stamps in there for Colombia? No. Okay. <clears throat> you can go ahead and um, set that to the side. And then as it relates to um, the Tiguan, we 
I mentioned that we're going to get into a more extensive search through some FBI agents later on in this trial. Uh, but did you do a search of that particular vehicle on February 1st of 2020? Yes. I may approach with People's Exhibit 325. You may. Have you had a chance to look at that item, 325? Yes. Do you recognize it? Yes, it is labeled as a receipt from the Colorado Springs Airport dated January 28th from the front passenger seat of, and it's cut off there, but I know it's the TIG one. Okay. Um, is that an item that you actually seized from that TIG one search on February 1st, 2020? Yes. Um, will you go ahead and open up that envelope, please? Um, do you recognize the item that's inside of People's Exhibit 325? Yes. Is it, in fact, that parking receipt from the Colorado Springs Airport? Yes. Is it in the same or substantially the same condition today as the day that you recovered it? Yes. All right, move for admission of 325. No objection. All right, Exhibit 325 will be admitted. Are there, is there printing on that, um, automated printing from the Colorado Springs Airport? Yes. Are you familiar with the, the parking uh, arrangements at the Colorado Springs Airport? Yes. Uh, have you gone there both professionally and personally? Yes. Okay. So to obtain that type of a receipt from the Colorado Springs Airport, what do you have to do? Uh, when you enter in a vehicle, you get a parking um, voucher ticket. And then as you exit, you would pay for the amount of time that you've been parked in that parking lot. And you would get a receipt like this as you exited. Does it um, stamp on their uh, time stamps? to understand when somebody potentially entered or exited that parking area? Yes, the entry time is January 28th, 2020 at 8.30 a.m. And the exit time is January 28th, 2020 at 7.02 p.m. That type of evidence, um, parking receipts from an airport like that where there's stamping time stamps on there, does that help um, determine movement? Yes. Somebody? Yes. Okay. And is that why this particular item was seized in this investigation? Yes. Were there other things that um, you collected from vehicles that ended up uh, not necessarily being helpful to the investigation? Sure. Um, things like dirt samples or vegetation samples from the undercarriage, that kind of thing? Yes. Did that lead to any sort of uh, investigative leads that allowed you to pursue um, what might have happened with Gannon? Uh, they did not lead very far, no. Okay. You have just a moment, Your Honor? You may. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination. Mr. Cook? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Detective Price, hi. How Good afternoon. You? My name is Will Cook, and I'm representing along with Mr. Tolini, Letitia Stouch, Stalk. Um, Do you remember writing a report on February the 18th of 2020 and you requested a laboratory examination of quite a few different items? Yes. Okay. And it looks like I'm looking at 15 different items that you requested to be tested. Uh, DNA profiles were requested to be developed from those items. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you know if all the testing was done and completed ultimately on those? Um, I believe sometimes the lab omits certain items based on their own judgment of um, the best use of resources. Um, so I'm not sure if every single item was eventually tested, but I know um, certainly many of them were. But if I'm telling you, I'm looking at this report where you requested uh, 15 items be tested, um, you have no reason to believe that you didn't follow through with that and, abs and actually order those items be tested. I did. I, yeah, I ordered those to be tested. Do the labs, um, the, the scientist or the uh, 
phlebotomist or the serologist or the DNA analyst, do they have uh, the ability to reject a request for a test? Can they say, uh, you know, I'm going to override you, detective, I'm not testing this, and this is why, or, or I'm sorry, I'll... Hmm. They do have discretion as to what they test. Okay. Do they usually get back and say, hey, I don't think we need to tech to test this detective and this is why and you all agree? Sometimes. Or will they just unilaterally not test something? Um, the, the it depends on the circumstance spe okay. yeah, specific. Okay. Yeah. So in this investigation, uh, this, th this was a huge investigation, correct? Yes. You've had several, uh, there's been several other deputies that have come up and testified that this was the biggest one they'd ever seen. It was this, quite large, yes. This, this, between the search and the multi-state nature of this investigation, this is the biggest thing by far they had ever been involved in. That's a fair statement, sure. Okay. And in fact, um, you collected air filters from a Kia Rio, cabin air filters uh, from a Kia Rio, and soil debris from the wheel well of the Kia Rio. Is yes. that correct? And ultimately the soil debris was sent up to a scientist or an expert in Fort Collins and they couldn't make heads or tails of anything, correct? Correct. Okay. What specifically are you looking for though when you're collecting soil debris from the wheel well of a car? At the point that those items were collected, we had not yet located Gannon. And so we were looking for uh, different soil, different vegetation, which might give us a clue where those vehicles had traveled to and thus give us an idea of the, the travel patterns or where he might be located at. Okay. At that time, did you believe that the Kia Rio had been used to dispose of Gannon's body or did law enforcement believe that? It was a possibility. It was a possibility. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it, it looks like no stone was left unturned. I mean, uh, the engineer filter from the Tiguan, swabs of the undercarriage of the Tiguan, um, the Jetta that was driven by Harley. I mean, everything was swabs, air filters were examined, everything was done. It was a very thorough uh, investigation. Yes. And what date was uh, the Jetta and the Tiguan taken into custody or seized by law enforcement? I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm sorry. If I told you those vehicles were seized um, before the house at Mandan Drive was locked down or seized by police, would that sound reasonable to you? Yes. Okay. If I told you that quite a few days passed between the seizure of these vehicles, seizures of Miss Stouck's, uh, the defendant, Miss Stouck's telephone, uh, if several days passed from those events to when the house was actually seized and uh, locked off, uh, would that sound right to you? No. Um, we searched the house on January 28th, which was fairly early on. Okay, but I'm saying when the house was actually seized actual on February seizure. 7th, like yeah. nobody coming in going, we're putting up the tape. Okay, I agree with you on that. Yes. Okay. Why did it take so long if you had Miss Stalk on the radar, you had taken her phone, you had taken her cars, you had taken her daughter's cars, you had all this stuff. Why did it take so long to take seizure and control of the house? Uh, that's above my pay grade. But, okay. Uh, that, that, that wasn't your call. Yeah, I'm just a little fish. So. Okay. <laughs> I even saw in one of the vehicles there were insects collected from the vehicle to have them tested to figure out where that car had been. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Don't see that a lot in an investigation, do you? First time I've ever seen it, yes. Me too. Uh, have you ever heard of a closed, and I'm talking about travel now, I'm switching. Have you ever heard of a closed loop cruise, as in a cruise ship? Personally, no, I haven't. Okay. 
Um, and do you know in a closed loop cruise, you don't have to have passports? Yeah, sustained. Okay. Are you aware that on certain cruise stops, uh, cruises will go around to different islands and stop at different places, that in certain cruises, you do not have to have a passport to get into the country? I've never been on a cruise. I have no personal experience with cruises. Okay. And did you know that there were cruise lines that will travel the Caribbean, um, the Bahamas, Jamaica? Judge objection. He's already said he doesn't know anything about cruises. Yeah. I can I, say. If, if he doesn't know anything about cruises, he doesn't know anything about cruises. <laughs> Do you know if passport stamps are required of U.S. citizens going to other countries in all situations, or are there exceptions? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> and again, you don't have any idea about closer loop cruises. Um, no, I don't. Can I have just a moment, Your Honor? Me. That's all I have. Thank you, Detective. Have a good day. You too, sir. Are you right? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Do any of the jurors uh, have any questions for um, Detective Price? No? All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Before he leaves, Judge, can we have him put the items back in the uh, yeah. evidence? I was, I think that's probably a pretty good idea. Thank you, Detective. And just so that the record is clear, what you have there is one exhibit, but it also has an envelope in it that has different documents in that envelope. There was two exhibits. One of the exhibits did have a secondary envelope in it, and that's why I was making that record about pulling that secondary envelope out. So we just need to make sure that secondary envelope gets back at the exhibit that it's supposed to be in. Put it on the table. Mm -hmm. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. We would call Amber Cronin. And Judge, while we're bringing Ms. Cronin in to, the, um, to testify, we're going to be playing some more of these uh, recorded phone calls that we did earlier in the trial. There's, uh, I think, four total. And I can tell you the length of them if you'd like me to. Please. So People's Exhibit 51, which was previously, hold on just a second, uh, was previously admitted under Mr. Stauk, is 46 minutes long. Uh, People's Exhibit 52, previously admitted under Mr. Stauk, is one hour and four minutes long. Um, then we have a disc that will be admitted through Ms. Cronin that is 27 minutes and 44 seconds long. And then People's Exhibit 53 is a, another call that was admitted under Mr. Stauk, but will be published under uh, Ms. Cronin, 29 minutes and 34 seconds. All right, Ms. Cronin, if you would raise your right hand, please, ma'am. You just confirm the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. All right, go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. And uh, go ahead and have a seat. Mr. Allen, are we going to be using that easel? No, should I get that out of the way? Um, I think Mr. Combs would appreciate it. It'd be hard to get out if we don't. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, sir. Oops. Let's see things here. I'll get this into the right angle. Okay. 
All right, Mr. Allen. All right. Good afternoon, ma'am. How are you doing? Very well. Will you please introduce yourself to the jury and then spell your name for the record? My name is Amber Cronin, A-M-B-E-R-C-R-O-N-A-N. Ms. Cronin, what do you do for work? I'm a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. How long have you been with the FBI? About 15 years. What training do you have that allows you to do the job you currently do? I went through Quantico, which is about five months, and then I've had additional training since then, periodic training. Do you also have education that you use um, to allow you to do the job you do? Yes, I have a bachelor's degree in criminology and criminal justice. Um, did you also serve in the military? Yes, I did. Did that help? Um, does that help you in the job you do as well? Yes. What was your job in the military? I was a military intelligence analyst for six and a half years. Okay. <clears throat> what, um, what role do you currently serve with the FBI? I know you said special agent, but what does that mean? Uh, specifically, I'm assigned to work uh, all the crime that occurs at the Federal Correctional Complex in Florence, Colorado. Do you sometimes get tasked to help out with potentially other local crimes that occur here in the 4th Judicial District? Yes, as part of the Colorado Springs Resident Agency, we help out. Okay. Um, what was your assignment back in January of 2020? I was assigned to the same thing working as the, uh, at the prison. Okay. Did you get involved with the investigation into Gannon Stout's disappearance? Yes, I did. How did you get involved in that case? Uh, it was El Paso County needed assistance. So they had asked the Colorado Springs resident agency. So we helped out. What was your role in that investigation? Uh, I helped out in multiple ways. I was part of the consensual calls that Mr. Stout had with the defendant. I am also a member of the FBI's evidence response team, so I assisted on processing a couple of the vehicles, and I actually traveled out to South Carolina for the arrest. Okay. During the time that this case was being heavily investigated, uh, were there daily meetings, investigative-driven uh, meetings, to just update everybody involved in the case? Yes. Did you attend those meetings? I did. Well. What did that purpose, what was the purpose of those meetings other than just to update folks? It's so we could know what was going on in the investigation, new developments of what we were finding. Excuse me. Would investigators, detectives, um, special agents with the FBI come to those meetings and report whatever specific assignments they had had uh, and then assignments would be made to act on those uh, developments? Yes. Um, You'd mentioned the consensual phone calls. What do we mean when we're talking about consensual phone calls? It was phone calls between Mr. Stouch and the defendant that were recorded. What was your role as, as that process played out? I was one of the people that was in the room while those phone calls were being made. So I was able to listen to the phone calls as well as at times ask Mr. Stouch to ask additional questions if we had questions. Would you have uh, meetings with Mr. Stouck uh, prior to the phone calls actually occurring to give him tips on things to say or not say, that kind of thing? Yes. Um, and then in the actual, while the phone calls were happening, would sometimes you would either suggest things to him or pass notes to him to say or not say? Yes. <clears throat> was another special agent, um, Johnny Grusing, also involved in that process? Yes, he was. Were those phone calls recorded? Yes. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I would uh, request permission to publish People's Exhibit 51, and I doubt we'll be able to get all the way through this. This is uh, previously admitted under Mr. Stauk, and it's 46 minutes long. Okay. Um, and uh, Agent Cronin, you can go ahead and step. What are you? Do you have any? It's not during the phone call, Your Honor. Yep. Agent Cronin, you can go ahead and step down. It's uh, not comfortable to sit there for that like period of time. So uh, go ahead, uh, exhibit 51 has already been admitted. And judge, would you like us to stop at about 10 till, five till so, roughly? Uh, 10 till. Okay, we'll do that. Able to exhibit 51. And just, just for the record, judge, uh, people's exhibit 51 um, is phone call from February 15, 2020 at 10 04 a.m.
Yeah, I think we need the screen to be able to see what she needs to click on, Judge. Oh, so you, uh, this has video with it? No, there's no video, but like the other ones, the player actually pops up on that screen. Oh, I got it. Okay. I don't even know what number to call her on. I told her to call. I guess I can try this when she's texting. Hello. Hey. Hey. Why are you moving again? Why do you think? I mean, I got it's. It's like a week by week thing. I told you that. You do what? I'm like week by week in these hotels. Why? Why can't you live in the house? I I don't know. I can't even like go in without an escort at this point. So. So how how are you paying for hotels? I just paid a little bit week by week, and uh, Uncle Jeff paid for this past week, so I told you that already. That Are you by yourself? Yes. Did you spend last night by yourself? Yes. Why, who else would I be with? I should have been with you, Albert. You think I wasn't lonely on freaking Valentine's Day? I'm to be with you. I've been begging to be with you. We can talk about that, but I, I want to talk about whatever you got. You're talking about on this iCloud. No, I logged back. I got into my iCloud finally because I only had partial whatever, and I couldn't do a, a backup. And I I got finally got the backup done, and there was like a crap ton of messages came through on my phone, and there's this um, text message that they should have saw on my phone because it came through on um, February 5th, and it's like basically almost like a a retarded person or something, but they, it says the boy or money or no boy. And I tried to get help. I sent it, from, I sent it to the tip line to see if they can check. I've been trying to call all morning to get help, but no one. Hey, I can't hear you. I said no one helps me because I'm a bad person. But can what, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, but what, I mean... That's all it said? No money, no boy, or something like that? I'm, I'm saying there's a bunch of there's voicemails. Like, it came, I had 30-some voicemails, and a lot of them were crap, bull crap, and threats, and stuff, so I had went through all of them. And, like, literally all I saw was the first message that said that, and it freaked me out, and I started, I had someone to look up the number to try to see where it was at, and it said, like, it says that it came from, it originated from Washington. But it weren't one of those, like, fake things. It was actual number from Washington. Um, like, I had someone track the number where it was at now, and it went to Roy, it was right outside of Roy Elementary. Where's that at? I don't know if this is, like, people scoring with me. I don't know, but I was trying to reach out to you as soon as I seen it so that they should have solved this on my phone. 
Girl, I, February 5th. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I know they're, they're like laser focused on finding Ganon right now, and that's kind of, that's kind of the priority right now. Um, I mean. That, but that was, that was why I was saying that. That is about Ganon. Why are you trying to make it seem like I wasn't? I, I'm not trying to make it seem like nothing. I mean, I, I, did you tell them about what we talked about yesterday about Quincy Brown and all that? I sent it in. Yes. Did that same thing that they keep posting online because no one would write me back on the numbers that they did. Well, I guarantee you they're out looking for that dude now because he is freaking. I, you know how I go. I get all worried about Mike and Landon and all that shit back home, and I looked him up and he's a freaking. Oh my god, sex offender. He's a bad dude, Tisha. And if he's got my son, and I'm freaking. You know how I was about Mike, and he had some criminal stuff, but this is a whole nother level. So I'm sure they're out looking for him now. So. Did you give them the information? That. Did. Yeah, you said you did. I mean. Yeah, I know, I did. Right, you said you were talking to Bethel, right? I sent it to Bethel Sure, but she never wrote back. So I had that Kate, somebody's number, the other lady that was with her that day. So I sent it to her because I was like, between her and her, someone would read the messages. Okay, yeah. I haven't got it. Mark hasn't reached out to me this morning, so, but I'm sure that, I, I mean, based on this dude being as freaking horrible as he is, I'm sure they're out there looking for him. Can you, I mean, can you remember anything else about Quincy Brown? Other than, I know you said you saw his ID. Uh, I mean, they had the bike or the SUV, right, with the, the bike rack. I mean, anything close to an address at all that, they, that would help them? Now that you have more... If you would let me come be with you and help, I will walk everybody through everything. But you're refusing that and not standing up for me to do that. No, actually I am. I'm, I'm trying to get this relevant information that you're providing to them. So that is standing okay. up for you. Okay, take it up for me too. It's also you've got to understand, Albert, and, and, this is, and this is not me trying to take away from whatever. Unless I'm like protected completely this is it, it, it's just a whole crazy thing you got to understand Albert well help me understand I'm begging you to tell you that I begged you to come stay with you just I've been like babe let me just stay with you spend a night please I will talk to you please I, I, everything I've tried everything and you just keep telling me no and I and I hate them lonely and I hate all this because I'm not I am I'm not a bad person I'm innocent I agreed to even take a lie detector test for you. Well, that's, that, I mean, that's not for me. I don't have, I, I'm not going to give you a lie detector test. Well, I mean. It's not, it's not, it's not permissible in court, because it's, it's not. It's, I said for you, for you to believe me. But who are you, have you talked to them about the, this lie detector test, or you just told me about it? No, I, I got recalled from a big time attorney. I got a Baez law firm willing to come and meet me. That's how, how much they know is screwed up. You know who the Bios Law Firm is? Uh, you know I don't pay attention to that shit. Do you know who they represented? No, tell me. A lot of big time names. And they're, and, and like People Magazine, people are like pissed that they're not, that the way that things are going is not, it's not the direction of my team. And so if you don't want to be on my team to be like against them fucking everything, then these people will put it out there. What that? Uh, what are they? What are they gonna? gonna do it. What are they gonna put out there? What? That you're gonna take a lie detector? No. Yeah, I will for you. I will do it for you. Well, let's we'll do, do it. We'll do it then. Let, then let's do it. Let's do it now. I mean, let, call yeah, the call the FBI or call whoever and tell them you're ready today. I don't know who to call. You have all these contacts. Nobody will talk to me. The only person I know, listen, you, you, I, I sent you a number. I think, uh, what was her name from the FBI? Amber, maybe? I sent you an email. You look back on your email, you got a contact. And she, she, when she called me that one time, she reached out and said, anything you need, any way we can help, anything we can do to help find Gannon. And I think that would qualify as something that would help. Okay? That would qualify. You're talking about this lie detector test. That will help find Gannon by me taking a lie detector test I've already told you. If you're, listen, listen, I know, but listen, listen to me. Walk through this logically. You're smart now, okay? If 
you're saying they're barking up the wrong tree, okay? Yeah. And that that wrong tree is you, and a lie detector test will get them off of that tree and on a, on a different tree. Don't you think that will help? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it'll, back to what we talked about yesterday, it'll show your innocence, it'll show you didn't do it, it'll show you don't even need immunity. Okay? You don't, I mean, all the, it'll prove all those things. You don't have to because my tests are not, are not permissible in court. Okay, uh, but I'm just trying to, you said you'll do that for me. What the test does is, is what a person's saying to someone they're trying to prove to. Like, people go and Dr. Phil and do it, places like that. Uh, okay, all right. Hey, Tisha, 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 listen. I'm willing, I, I'm willing to take the lie detector test. You brought it up. I mean... I'm willing to work with you or whatever you can contact the FBI and do it. I'm willing to take that result for my peace of mind. But if you're going to sit here and tell me it's not worthwhile, then why even talk about it? I said for you. I said I wanted to do it for you. You're focusing on doing it for someone else. I'm trying to tell you I want it. Oh, no, no. So it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Gannon. If they're barking okay, up the wrong so tree, for babe, if they're barking up the wrong tree, this will get them on the right tree, okay? Okay. So, so you need to reach out to Amber, whatever her name is. That's the FBI lady that I talked to the one time, and you need to tell her whatever you're willing to do or not do. Okay? That's I mean that's the only way I know to go about it. So, but instead of instead of me waiting on the lie detector test for me and you, I know that'll confirm it. Just tell me the tell me the truth right now. You won't even help me get the freaking ID so I can go to a doctor's office and you want me to just keep going over and over and over the same thing. Yeah, Tisha, yes, I do, because... It, Did you kick me off a of TRICARE or something? I can't kick you off a of TRICARE. That only happens if... Anyways, you're trying to spin this in a different direction. We're talking about... Just trying to go to the doctor, that's you, it. You could go to the doctor any day of the week. I can't kick you off a of TRICARE. <laughs> They took all my stuff. I need an ID. You need the sponsor's social security number, and I know you know my social, so don't even play me, T. Can't go on base. Okay. Without the ID. Well, go to if you if you got to go to the doctor that bad, go to the doctor somewhere, uh, and we'll pay the fee. Okay. Let, that, that's I'm not gonna say that's irrelevant, but we're focused on Gannon right now. Okay. Okay, and we're trying to be with you to focus on Gannon. So no. that's when you and, can. And guess what? We are talking together right now, so. We are working together on this right now on the phone, okay? You come and stay with me, and I will meet them to do the test and everything. I, I, listen, I need the truth first, and that's what I've said the whole time. Tell me the same. Listen, let's just stop, okay? No, don't, oh, God, me. You put a lie detector test, and now it's still not good enough for you, Albert. No, it is. It's perfect. That's what I want you to do, okay? Because there has been multiple stories. But tell me the story right now that you're going to tell on the lie detector test. That's what I want. You don't tell stories on a lie detector test. I know. Okay. Yes, do, you want me to, do you want me to put you through that and ask you questions? I'll do it, okay? Is, that bike sac is the bike accident a true story? Did he fall and bust his head, or was his head already bleeding before you got there? Which one is it? Bleeding. I'm just asking. Was a bike accident true? Already be bleeding. I don't know because I have fallen off my bike a hundred times and didn't bust my head bad enough to go to the nine one one. Right? Okay. I'm just trying to sort through this. Is the bike accident true? Albert, I did not hurt you. I didn't ask you that. Okay. Is the bike accident true? It's yes or no. This is lie detector test right now. Yes or no. It somebody has Dan and Albert. I need protection to help you. I understand that, and I'm trying to help you right now. Beat me. He will abuse me. He will hurt me, and I keep telling you this, and you're not catching the hit. Is the bike accident true? That's where we're starting. They're gonna protect me from him. We're gonna, yes, you're gonna, if once you call Amber, you're gonna get the protection you need. I don't have a gun, I don't have a badge, Amber does, and she's the one that's gonna protect you. But you are my husband. Why I am, and, and as your husband, you need to respect that I'm trying to give you the best guidance I have, okay, and get you to the protection you're asking for. If you call Amber, she'll get somebody with you wherever you're at to protect you, okay? But why aren't you willing to do that? How am I going to protect you against people trying to beat you and kill you? Come live 
with you because you are my husband and you're supposed to provide for us a place to stay. Right. And I, I've done that from day one. So you're not going to question my ability to protect or provide you. So listen, hey, back up. You said you wanted to do something for me. Yes, no, Albert. No. Because, baby. I'm not answering any questions right now because you told me that you do something for me. And that's answer some yes and no questions. Basically a lie detector. Be with you. I didn't say like you're going to put me on. We can talk about this in person. Why does it have to be on her phone so you can like record people and shit? So now I'm recording you. The, the, what you've done to me for five years is what I'm doing to you. That's projection teaching. And I'm not putting up with that. Okay. All right. Did you record me yesterday? No. Why would I record you? I haven't recorded anything. What are you talking about? Would you coach and you want to say? No, well, I don't need a coach. I've done this for a living for t 11 years, Tisha. I said I want to talk to you in person. All right, go. Well, guess what? Your freaking sister's calling me. Tell her to leave me alone. Who? Oh, what sister? Amy, whatever her name is. She shouldn't be calling you. Don't even talk to them. Well, I've been getting calls and texts from all your people, and I don't. I, I'm sick of it. Listen, I. You know what? If if meeting is what it takes to get to the truth, I'll meet with you. But you need to answer some questions first. That's my that is your way of proving to me that a meeting is worthwhile. Okay? Okay. Number 1. I got 3 or 4 questions, okay? Number 1. Is the bike accident true? No. No. Is Quincy Brown true? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so what happened? Okay, that's my next question. What happened to get Gannon to Quincy Brown? How did Quincy Brown get my son? It doesn't matter how many times I tell you, you're still going to call me a liar. No, you're not going to take that's time. not true now. That's not true. I've given you every opportunity to tell the truth, just like I'm doing now. Okay. I haven't called you a liar. I've said some pieces of the story have been not true. Okay. I'm not sitting here calling you names. I'm not putting you down. I'm asking for truth. Okay. You said the bike accident is not true now. Fair enough. We're done with that, okay? What happened? We were going to get you a bike, though. That was true. Okay, so you were going to get me a bike. Fine. Okay, let's get past the bike. If the bike has nothing to do with with anything, then let's just forget about the bike and the trip to the bike. I'm trying to be a toy mom, okay? Okay. I wanted to hang out with some friends. And I was just trying to be cool because I'm never looked at as being cool. So I told him, hey, we'll just... You can... Have a sleepover, whatever, 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 yada, yada, yada. That was supposed to happen on Saturday or something. He did have this friend out of car, and I told him, your daddy said no. I told him that on Sunday or whatever day it was. But prior to that, he'd already said something to me about this, and I tried to talk to him through the situation. So the plan was he was going to have a sleepover. We split both the beds together, yada, 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 yada. That was just supposed to be the plan. I was just trying to be a cool mom. I just wanted to be accepted by Gannon and for him to be like, wow, yeah, she always kind of tricked on us, but maybe she maybe let me do a little bit that I shouldn't probably be doing. Hey, that's all. Yeah, but that, but okay, okay, that's... It went downhill from there, I'm telling you. Okay, like, I didn't okay. Do anything to Gannon. Okay, so... I, all these people, listen to me. I'm sorry, I'm listening. Of all, all these people putting all this stupid stuff about blood and all this bull crap. If there's any blood in the house, it's because of Gannon. Gannon bleeds all the time. Okay. There's no, there's no massacre occurred in our home. It's not what people are putting in their head. There's nothing like that. Okay? It's nothing. I'm sick of hearing people say, well, if he hurt his foot, he could be walking. Oh, my God. It was just blood from his foot. That's it. There was no, like, he hit his head or like that. I'm tired of all these conspiracy theories, and now it's in your head that you think that, I, that I'm doing something to Gannon in our house, because that's what you said yesterday. That is not true. There's blood there just simply from what happened to his foot, and yes, I've already admitted to you that his arm was burned. Okay. 
she admitted that to you. Wasn't that bad? Did it have blood? Yes. And I keep on doing the candle work. But, I did everything I could. So right. if you're asking about that part of it, you see, what y'all were doing is trying to take two different things. You're trying to think that just because I didn't abuse Dan emotionally in no video, nothing. The whole point of that was he was so upset. And it wasn't about, it was meaning I was going to replace the items for him. It was trying to be, okay, don't worry about it. It's a secret. I'm not going to say anything. I was trying to be cool. Okay? Maybe if I let my guard down for trying to be cool, I let him stay up 30 minutes late that night trying to be cool. Just trying to be like, we'll start working on, hey, you stand up 30 minutes later than Lena. So any of that that you got from some mind that people are trying to say I was abusing him on some video shit, it was not. Then it was upset because I was sitting there holding him and everybody saying something about whatever. I am situation. It wasn't a lot of tons and tons of blood. We got it up. It was, it was on his wall a little bit. I mean, it was it was not even a lot. So, you cleaned his wall up? But he did. Oh, okay. And there was blood on the thing. We, we cleaned up stuff. It was not. It was from his arms and his foot. That's all. From helping me outside. There was nobody said it did. She could hear in all these stories. Cannon's head was hit. He was doing this. No! Albert, if he would have been in that situation, I get on the phone and I call 911. I'm not stupid. Do you think I'd much rather be sitting here with someone saying that I was being irresponsible or whatever than that someone accusing me of hurting a child? Do you think that? That's the way I panic at the sight of blood? You are so freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, stop peeling it. He peeled it and peeled it and peeled it. If I yell at him for peeling it, it's going to look like I'm mad at him. You don't understand. Okay. Everybody, the true story, but what they're doing is they're coming in there and trying to say, just because, just because some lady who thinks she's hot sick that's been talking to you, apparently, she posts online all this bullshit. Who? Who? What lady? Oh, no. Trivia of somebody. Who? This, uh, she's fucking stupid. I haven't because, talked to nobody. Okay, well, she's online saying she's talking to you and Landon, and you and Landon were saying there was blood all over again his room. I, so I, blood I everywhere in the house. I don't, blood on the stairs. Who is this now? That is not true. If it was anything, it was from the foot. And I stepped right outside. I stepped in and on the carpet when I freaking took the carpet up that we walk outside on. But nobody cares that that's, the, that's how it happened. That's where blood came from. Do you not it was not puddles? If we cleaned it up and smeared it, sorry. What, what freaking lady are you talking about? What? The beds were already put together because I had told Dan and he could have a sleepover. The beds were pushed together? I had pushed them together because I had told him on Sunday he could have a sleepover. I didn't know that his stomach was going to go to start hurting. I had already said he was doing his box. But who was, the, who was the sleepover with? Was it Brayden? He just asked me, could he have a sleepover, even though it was a school night? After we were on the hike. And the reason I said yes, because we were sitting there talking about the whole coach thing. He talked to me about the sisters, and all he had was sisters. I said yes, just because I felt so bad. Because here we are both in an emotional moment. I'm upset about Kobe. He's upset about him having girls, yada, yada, yada. I agree. Sorry, I usually don't agree to things. I was trying to be like, okay, maybe this is a good chance, but maybe bend the rules just a little bit. So, yes, the Cannon, you can have a sleepover. Cannon pushed his beds together. Well, yada, yada, yada. I don't know what happened, why he didn't go ask about sleepover. I don't know what happened, wherever. I don't know. He didn't ever come say such and such. Didn't say whatever. I just know his stomach was hurting. So I assumed he didn't want to be having a sleepover with the boy, wherever the boy was. Uh, why? Tell me. Hold on, hold on. Why? Why? 
So you were going to let it, what, let me back up. What? I wasn't going to let the boy, but he said his, his brother had a car. Right, okay, okay, fine. But they he's never pushed the beds together for a sleepover before. Where where did that come from? What do you mean? No, I, I do. No, usually they... They put the beds together. They, they, they were, Albert, we pushed the beds together because he had all the things lined up around the room and little cardboard boxes. They were all lined up around the room, and we pushed the beds together. That was it. No, that, I mean, be pushing the beds together is not a crime. I, I'm not saying it was. It's just weird because he's, uh, to my knowledge, he's never done that. He was building a, I guess he was going to build a fort. I don't know. Okay. Was just for Sunday. They got pushed back. I mean, it was nothing. Okay. All right. All right. Just, so, so that is the only reason, that is the only reason when they got pushed back that he would have had normal that he would have killed his arm after it happened on Sunday. So, I don't do it whoever your friend is and neighbor that knows all this bullshit to give you the video footage of running out when the bag on fire was going on. And, and you will see, oh, was I being whatever? Was I fussing? Was I doing anything but being loving to children? Right. You know, I told everybody. Oh, it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna fix it. Nobody was yelling at anybody. Nobody was angry with anybody. Nobody was hurting anybody. Nobody was doing anything wrong. But how, so it wasn't even that. I was scared. But how? But uh, back up to something you said that I I mean that really struck me, Tisha. You said it went it went downhill. How? What do you mean? How did it go downhill? And then how did this Quincy Brown freaking dude get involved? The story about Quincy. Right. He told no, but me. okay, but tell me the part about how did it go downhill? That's what I need to know. You said it went downhill fast and it got out of control, and you know maybe you freaked out, whatever. But I never said anything about getting out of control. Now you're putting words in my mouth. I never said. Okay, that. you said it went downhill, Tisha. I said it went downhill, meaning Gannon was supposed to have a sleepover. His stomach started hurting. That's why we didn't get to have a sleepover. That's what it means. It means that. Okay. Okay, I got you. Meeting. I got you. He stays up late. All right, so listen. See, see how when you, I talk to you, do you see how you already put me as if I'm some criminal? No, see no. I, I, haven't, I haven't criminalized you at all. I'm asking you questions. That's what you wanted me to do, and I'm asking you questions. I would bet you. I mean, really, come on, Albert. That is not you saying to me if, gosh, you know, how many times have you left out of time and my wife has took care of everything? That's not you doing that. That's not you taking my side. It's you picking up on. Hey, I can't hear you. Building a box. I said you're saying something about us putting beds together when the child was building a box because you thought this is a box for his son. It's a problem if I get involved, and if it's a problem if I do it the wrong way. No, I'm but just. The right way. I'm just trying to figure out. What you think? T-shirt, babe. Listen, okay. You, I mean, I'm worried to death about Gannon's safety, where he's at, all these things. I mean, yesterday, what you told me the bike story is not true now, okay? But but you also said he had a hit. You know how I feel? You want me to be honest with you? You know how I feel? I feel like if, you just, if I just tell you something like that, it's what you want to hear. That's honestly how you make me feel. You make me feel if I just tell you there's some truck. Because I even sit there and listen to you go, okay, it was an accident, okay. This is what someone wants you to say or you're... No. Because that is not Albert. No. Yes. Actually, yes, it is. You know, as a recruiter, I did the same shit for 11 years, having to dig into people's past and everything, okay? And to to get the truth. And you said... All right, listen. Listen, you told me. You keep telling me what I just want to hear. I just want to hear the truth, Tisha. Okay? All right, you told... No, hold on. Yesterday... No, no, listen. Yesterday... And we've, we've passed this point, but you said there was a bike accident with a head injury. So is it just a bike accident that's not true? Or is it the head injury also that's not true? No, there's no head injury or bike accident. I just told you, I felt okay. like you wanted me to say something to you. Okay, so now, what did freaking Quincy Brown do with Gannon? How did... He saw, can I ask you something? Do you think I, first of all, I want you to put this in perspective. Okay. Do you think I even know my my way around Colorado, first off? Yeah, we've been here a year now. You go all over the place. Okay, Colorado Springs, right? 
I'll, 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 you've been, uh, yes. And we've been all over up there around the outlets, and we've been up there to Denver a bunch. Yes, I think you know a little bit about Colorado, so don't play me on that, Tisha. I wasn't, see, I wasn't even going there. Do you see how I said that just to see you jump at me? Do you see how I said that? Well, good. You got me. You got me jumping, all right? My son's out there missing with Quincy Brown, and you got me jumping. You win, all right? What's your next question? Listen to me. Can you listen to me? Yeah, sure. All right. We'll pause it here, and just for record purposes, I think the timestamp is 29 minutes and 45 seconds. Looks like it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our evening recess. Uh, if we can have everyone back in the jury room ready to go at 9 o'clock in the morning, we should be able to start on time. Uh, again, don't discuss the case among yourselves. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. Um, with that, have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning. All right, with the jury, please. may all be seated record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time prosecution judge um if we could approach okay Okay. Um, court will be in recess then. We'll see everybody in the morning. Thank you. All right.